Okay. All right. Well, I, I just heard the recordings in process, so I do want to make sure that everybody knows at the beginning that uh, due, due to COVID, we have authorization during the emergency rules to meet remotely. And uh, so that's how we're meeting for now. And it looks like we're going to continue to do that for a while. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows that this is being recorded and you're being recorded. So be careful what you say. Um, and once the meeting is over, we will be posting in this uh, on the uh, website and on our YouTube channel so that uh, if people wanna watch the meeting later, they'll be, they'll be able to do that. So with that, I'm actually, I, I like this idea of calling roll at the beginning to make sure to see who we have and that we have a quorum. So um, I'm here and if I call your name out just to say if you're present or not. Uh, Margaret, do not see her yet. Hey, Brad, are you there? Yes. Okay, Corla. Present. Mandy. Present. Eva. Okay. Don. He's here. He's trying to unmute. All right. I think I saw a mouth word present, so I'm going to count him. Robert Trip Jackson. Yep. How are you feeling, yeah. Robert? Good. How about you? Good. But I didn't have I didn't have any surgery like you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Angela. Present. All right. I don't think Tina's here. Nicole. Present. Matt. Hi, I'm here. Good. Uh, Joe. I'm here. Sam, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good. Paul Webb. Here. Oh, All right, perfect. Well, so I count, I count 12. So that's definitely a quorum. So with that, we can start. So, um, Everybody should have a copy of the agenda. Does somebody want to make a motion to approve the agenda? Or uh, if anybody wants to discuss the agenda, we can do that and move forward. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Okay. We have a second. second. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any discussion? All right. All those in favor, raise your hands. All right. That is a majority. So we are that we're going forward with the agenda. So. Uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the minutes. I know that Mandy circulated the minutes. Everybody's had an opportunity to review them. Um, do we have any questions or comments about the minutes? Um, one comment I had was uh, uh, in the page four, the uh, penultimate paragraph, uh, I thought a word was missing the word pass or passes, but I'll uh, try to bring that up on my screen. I don't have that right now. Okay, well, Sam, if you send that, send that to Mandy to, to, so she can take a look at it. Okay, we'll do. All right, any other, any other revisions to the minutes? All right, can we have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. All right, Sam's moved. Do we have a second? Robert Tripp Jackson, second. All those in favor, raise your hand. It appears to be unanimous to me. There we go. Perfect. <clears throat> All right. All right. So now we're going to do board officer reports. And I, I guess I'm going to start as, uh, as the chair. And unfortunately, uh, Margaret's not here because the first thing on my list to do was to thank Margaret for her sharing last time she did a great job yeah exactly so really appreciate it when everybody pitches in and i really appreciated margaret doing that and that was a big help to me and that kind of winds into the the health of the organization is still strong we have a lot of people contributing and, and doing good things in the community and making a difference so i want to thank everybody on the board and i want to thank all the the public members that are also participating because you know it's all it's all a combination so the, the planning board is healthy and it's making a difference and people are working hard and doing a good job. So thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, mentioned the, um, I mentioned the state of emergency. I, I got a report that the city council has uh, extended the state of emergency. So it appears to me that uh, we will be meeting for at least the next uh, two or three months remotely. And I don't know, I don't know when, it, uh, if ever we're going to get to meet in person, I would like to meet in person someday, but um, 
But for now, we're going to continue to meet, uh, meet remotely, probably in January and February, and then we'll, we'll see where we go from there. In that regard, as, as people that have been on the board before know, but the, uh, for the new members, we are typically dark in December. So my, my plan would be to follow tradition and be dark in uh, December and let people uh, spend December with their family. So that's the plan. And then lastly, uh, as the board chair, I've also been working on the San Diego City Redistricting Commission, which is why I was in here last time. So uh, it's been a big job. And um, our last few me minute uh, meetings, we've had five hours of public comment before we get to uh, do our work. So we started meeting at 5.30 and we have public comment till 10.30 at night. And then we talk about the map from 10.30 to midnight. So it's, uh, it's a challenge uh, for, for me to stay up that late, but it's, uh, it's insp inspiring to, uh, to see the uh, public interest and to, and to see people participate. And um, we're, doing, we're trying to do our best to, protect the interests of, of, of everybody in the city, but also, you know, the residents of, of District 2 and, and Point Loma, Ocean Beach and Midway, make sure that we all get fair representation. So the, st the status, so everybody knows, is that we have adopted a preliminary map. And uh, if you went on the redistricting website, you can see what uh, District 2 has changed a little bit, mostly because of short-term vacation rentals losing population. So we, we've added uh, into Claremont. The... Um, the plan is that um, the per, there'll be five meetings to discuss the preliminary map and make any adjustments that people want to. And we're in the process of doing those five me meetings. And then we're hopefully to, uh, trying to get the final map approved by December 15th so that it'll be in place for next year's elections and um, all of the uh, primaries that are, that are gonna happen next year. So, so that's where we stand. Any questions for the chair? Uh, Fred, I, it's probably moot at this point. Was there any discussion about the Pacific Highway area where the Navy could build up to 45 stories, whether that should be in Mission Hills or, or moved? Yeah, there, there actually there was. I mean, that, that, and that's kind of one of those interesting issues. There was certainly a discussion about that. I think there's also a testimony that went you know, the other way, that Midway is part of, Midway is tied traditionally to Point Loma and Ocean Beach. And so it should be in district two. The thing that's tricky with re redistricting is that, you, you know, that we have to take the, the, the statistics that we have now. And so you can't, you can't project, right? You don't, so, so we know that that's gonna build up there and there's gonna be more population. That's gonna change the numbers over the 10 years, but, but the map has to be drawn based upon the census numbers that were that were calculated based on this last cen census. So the future numbers do not do not actually impact where you draw the lines for now. Thank you. Tracy. Um, thank you for all the work you're doing. I swear to God, every time I chime in on those meetings, I'm just like, oh my God, I can't believe they have to listen to multiple, multiple hours of public comment. <laughs> you're you're a champ, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, I did have a question though. So I was on the... Pacific Beach Town Council meeting last night, and they were talking about how um, Mission Bay and Mission Beach is now, they're going to, like PB is moving up to District 1, but Mission Bay and Mission Beach were staying in District 2, and some of the people seemed rather confused about why, if there's no population, really people living in Mission Bay <laughs> or Mission Beach area, that or Mission Bay, why wouldn't it be like part of their territory? So I don't know if you can talk to, you know, why that was a kind of a, a decision to keep Mission Bay like part of District 2 when there really isn't anybody and predominant, like they feel like, they feel like PB is part of Mission Bay and should get to keep Mission Bay. And then I had a question regarding that because if, if Mission Bay is taken out of District 2, but yet, for example, Ocean Beach has a lot of its parks that are managed by Mission Bay Parks and Rec, does Ocean Beach get our parks back if it stays in District, if, if they're no longer being like managed by Mission Bay and Mission Bay is in District 1? Does that make sense? I, I, it, yeah. it, I don't know it if make, it makes sense. It makes sense. sense. Um, I can... 
I don't know the answer to the second question. I, I can, on the first question, there's, there's testimony that goes, you know, there's, there's testimony that goes back and forth between Bay Park and, and part of Pacific Beach is still in, in District 2 and Mission Bay is in District 2 and Mission Beach, I mean, and so, and it's really kind of the population shift to try to keep District 1 together that, that part of Pacific Beach has been moved into District 1. So um, I'm happy to look at that. And some of those areas uh, can be shifted around because that's it's still a preliminary map uh, right now, uh, especially if they don't have an impact on, on population. But we're kind of at the stage with the preliminary map that um, it's, it's, a, it's a horse trading now, right? So if you want to move a thousand people out of District 1, you got to figure out you know, where are you going to put them and, and what you're going to, what, what's the trade-offs going to be. So um, yeah. I'm happy to look at that, especially if it doesn't have a population shift. But I think that the, between Bay Park, Mission Beach, even Point Loma and Ocean Beach, there's also, there's all a strong tie to, to, to the Bay. And I think actually there's, a, you know, I think there's an argument that Mission Bay will get more protection if it has District 1 and District 2 representatives looking after it, but, um, but we will see. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next redistricting meeting, Tuesday, five, uh, five o'clock. So uh, they're starting early so we can get our five hours of testimony in over by 10. So feel free to join me. All right, with that, uh, Margaret's not here. So Brad- oh, She just, she no, just, she just came. Did she hear? Mm -hmm. Where's Margaret? Loud and clear. <laughs> okay, Margaret, I'm gonna add you to the attendance. So uh, I don't know, you missed the part that I started the meeting by thanking you for doing such a great job at the last meeting. And I really sincerely appreciate you doing such a great job and stepping up to the plate. So thank you very much. Thank you, and you were missed. Well, I missed everybody there. So now as a, as a first vice chair, I don't know if you have any report that you'd like to make. Nope, I think you're covering it all about the redistricting and all that good stuff. So yeah, there's a lot going on in the different um, Have a great safe trip. different uh, neighboring communities. And I see DK's on here. That's great. Tracy's on here. That's great. I'm sure that they can recap in their in their areas. But other than that, as I get information, um, as I receive it, I share it with uh, our group in hopes that we're all on board and if need be, we can support some of the fights that are going out there in the neighboring communities. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Margaret. Brad, do you have any report? Um, well, actually I do. Um, you know, Margaret's coming about sharing and uh, again, Margaret did a great job last month and thank you, Fred, it's been enjoyable to to read your quotes in the paper on uh, redistricting. So uh, I'm like, I know that guy, that's Fred. So um, anyway, regarding uh, comments, uh, Margaret sent out an email the other day regarding the Rob Field roundabout. And uh, I'd ridden through there on my bike uh, when it was in, under construction and it sure seemed small at the time, but uh, it's done. And I went through it the other day and uh, uh, it made me curious about what's going on in the community. So of course I got on the phone. So anyway, bear with me. I'm going to talk really fast, but I've got a, 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 just something that I wanted to share with the community and has a lot to do with both what our great traffic committee has been doing, um, things that were done in the past regarding roundabouts and beacons and uh, some traffic info. So <clears throat> thank you. Um, first thing is flashing beacons. You know, we've talked about those and why aren't they getting done? And uh, I did talk to both Gary Pence and uh, Phil Russ down at traffic. And Gary just said that the flashing beacon group is the same group that does the lights. And if lights break, they're not putting in beacons. And there are also numerous vacancies and they're fully understaffed and they were backlogged before COVID and now they're really backlogged. So just to let you know, that's why things that we've been waiting for for four years are not getting done yet. So um, Phil Russ, who I spoke with, um, is head of roundabouts. And so we've seen, and also in talking to Gary, 
getting on this committee and, and you're trying to get these things done and you're sending out all these letters, but it's like, where do the letters go? Who sees them? And feedback on the letters, what, you know, four years and you don't know what's going on. And we've got, we, in 2018, we did this, uh, uh, the diff, you know, the developer impact feed list. And then we have the CIP lists. And then we have these uh, budget priority lists and they've got different things on them. And it's like, how do you keep it all straight? Um, so in talking to Gary, um, he kind of filled me in on some of those things because just because something's on a list doesn't mean it's necessarily been approved, of course. So <clears throat> I asked him about the, the roundabouts and um, I want to thank Tracy and her group and OB for getting that initial roundabout started. That is so awesome there at Rob Field. That's really great. And also to let you know that along Bacon, and you may know this, but at Voltaire and also at Brighton at the four-way stop, <clears throat> they've got um, ADA, they're missing ADA ramps. And so when they do that work, they're gonna go ahead and potentially put a roundabout at those two locations. So they're looking at it. These roundabouts are a million dollars a piece maybe, or more, depending on how big. So anyway, thanks, Tracy. You got the, the, the first one done, uh, you guys did, and um, other people get a chance to use it and, and see how uh, beneficial it is. Um, so I asked about what's going on here in Point Loma, and the first roundabout we're gonna get is the Nimitz and Evergreen, the real problematic We've had the flashing beacon, uh, you know, speed beacon, um, the house that keeps getting smashed. Uh, there at Lowell, Evergreen, and Nimitz. That's probably going to be the first one for us. Um, the next one is likely where the uh, up. They've done a temporary sort of fix up, and I don't. Again, he's not giving any time frames on these. It's Catalina and Canyon, where they used to have the free right, and now it's uh, pushed up to the light. Um, and uh, uh, Paul Grimes, I'm not sure if he's still here. There he is, Paul. Poinsettia and Voltaire is getting looked at from years ago when we talked about the roundabouts that we would like to see at certain places. Right there by the library is, uh, is um, a possible location. They think that would work really well there. Um, another thing is, is that when I was talking to Mr. Russ, he was talking, they're meeting with a San Diego company and this San Diego company has a modular modular roundabout system that they're gonna be proposing for the city to allow them to be able to put these roundabouts in faster without these giant constru construction crews. And this might cut the cost of these roundabouts by half or maybe as much as two thirds. So uh, that would allow these to be implemented a little bit easier. Um, and briefly we talked about, uh, I had heard a, a program on uh, NPR, uh, a couple few months back uh, about this place in Indiana. It's Carmel, Indiana, and they have replaced every intersection in their town. It's over 190 intersections with roundabouts. And uh, Mr. Russ knew that place off the top of his head. He goes, yeah, that place is the gold standard in the country for roundabouts. And the big deal about roundabouts is, it's basically, it's like all these always stops now turn into all way yields. And so <laughs> it calms traffic down, it allows the traffic to proceed. So that part is pretty awesome. Um, also to let the traffic committee know, um, Scott Street is on the radar already. So good job uh, last month. Uh, I know that we had some back and forth on that, but he's not sure how it's gonna get fit in. Maybe uh, Mandy and Nicole can follow up with Brian on that uh, and find out what's going on, but they're gonna be looking at that here pretty soon. So um, anyway, I do have some information on the on these individual letters that, that you guys have generated, which are awesome, uh, that much needed, but Gary and Russ had some comments about all three, all informative. Um, so at the time, when the time comes, maybe I could just chime in and share what I may have heard about those. So. Anyway, um, that's all I have for the moment, but thank you for the time. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, very informative. Mandy, do you have, it's your turn to go next, but you can ask Brad a question too. 
Sure. Mm. Brad, did they say, did they give an ETA on when the installation of the roundabouts were going to be installed? No, because, I mean, they're so expensive, you know, and in, in funding, you know, I made that comment about the DIF and the CIPs and where do they, what do they fall under and the city understaffed and they, you know, and they were behind before. So sometimes they find money and they can put things in unexpectedly or like mm -hmm. the situation potentially there at Bacon and Brighton where the crew's already there. And if they have to replace all four curbs for, you know, the ADA ramps, um, it's not that big a deal then at that point to go ahead and put the center circle in. So, but no, he, he wouldn't, he didn't give any time, time frames, you know, okay. uh, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer for that. No worries. Okay. Thank you for the information. Hey, Sharla, sure. do you have a question? Yeah, any mention of Rosecrans? There's been discussion for years about a couple of roundabouts. Yeah, I asked about uh, Bessemer, Owen, and McCall Street roundabouts. Uh, he didn't really, and I, because there was, uh, what was her name, Ms. Driscoll, right? Uh, who came in and been working tirelessly on that for six, seven years. Uh, he didn't really have much to say on the, in those locations. Though, so, yeah, the Bessemer one would work in slowing down traffic going around that curb. Um, and there's some others that I'll bring up maybe later when we talk about other. So, locations. Brad, what's he talking about with Catalina and Cannon? The, the yeah, all that. Yeah, all that hardscape there, right by where your office is, the light. Where, 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 where I landscaped it all. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, uh, get some pots and put the, uh, those plants in them, uh, maybe oh, at, at some God. point. Uh, anyway, this is preliminary. They're yeah. looking at it, Robert. You know how the city works. I mean, they've already right. did a partial fix there. It's probably going to be a decade before anything happens, right? Um, if we can't get a flashing beacon in four years, it's going to be how long for this? So don't know. I think Nicole's got a hand. Oh, you're muted, Nicole. Ah, sorry. And thank you, Brad, for the updates. Fabulous updates. Um, and it'll be exciting to see exactly. I'm not going to comment on the roundabout at West Point Loma yet because <laughs> so I don't really I don't want to make too many assumptions um and uh, it's tight it is I tight say that um that actually was a long it's been that's been a decade project and it was actually it was created a CIP project through Lori Zaff's office with Conrad Ware so right. um my question for you is those three that you pointed out in Point Loma Nimitz Catalina and Poinsettia those three different intersections, are they current, you know, that's the first step is getting them as CIP projects first. So um, um, or if they are something we might wanna look into. Right, and uh, I had a back and forth a while back with Monique uh, mm -hmm. trying to figure out, well, and she was telling us that, you know, we, it's not just the CIP projects, it's also this budget priority list that we're supposed to be generating Probably everybody should be thinking about that mm. and putting that on the map in May for June that everybody should put their wish list stuff on there to get it over to council's office because I kind of was sort of like, well, who told us that we needed to do this at, a, at this specific time? You know, give us a reminder, you know, we've got turnover. We had 10 people this last year. and Well, and not only that, Brad, I'll, I'll just say that that the, they're all, they're deciding their budget for 2023. So right. they're looking at these. So if we really had a, a, a big concern, there are, you know, there's those three, you know, I, I'm going to say that um, Nimitz and Evergreen, we all know that's warranted. Poinsettia and um, Voltaire was a long time request. Catalina and Cannon, I believe, was due to the fatality of Young. And, exactly. Uh, so, um, so those were the three, but um, at this point, I think Catalina and Cannon almost could be discussed as, as the substitution we're talking about tonight, but we'll, we can discuss later. Well, just, just to kind of, as an FYI, I mean, I was, what generated this is that I was looking at the diff list and the ones that we'd asked for and they'd been denied because they didn't meet the criteria. 
uh, the ones that we did in 18. And uh, one of the ones that's on the budget priority list for both 21 and 22 is what you guys are talking about at Hill, Santa Barbara, and Catalina, uh -huh. which has not made, it has been evaluated and did not make a roundabout list. Mm -hmm. So I was a little bit disappointed in that, but they are looking at it in other ways. And maybe I could just segue there. They're talking about doing Talbot and Catalina and that would, because it's just said the proximity is so close and there's so much more room there that their feeling is that that will slow things down a little bit if, if the roundabout is located down there. And also on Catalina, they've got these two white stripes that keep the intersection clear, which is causing enormous amount of confusion. Mm -hmm. And people, I mean, I've been on Catalina and had people stop in front of me at that white line because they yeah. think there's a stop. So they're, they are know that that's an out, outmoded uh, painting uh, plan and they are gonna get rid of that. Um, so just That's to let you know that uh, that letter you guys wrote is going to be great. Uh, we just got to keep doing them. And he says that those are impactful. And um, something is that is they are looking at that intersection. It's just they haven't really figured out how to do it, whether and, you know, I don't a light. I, I don't know. It's it's a tough intersection. And I went through it with him you know, from all different angles, if you're stopped and you can't see and all that. So anyway. All right, thanks. well, Brad, thank you. I, I'm gonna to try to move us forward. Yeah, sure, sure. Agenda, so we're, we're gonna move on. I'm gonna actually, I'm, I'm gonna to go to Corla as treasurer. Do you have a treasurer's report, Corla? I have a, you're, 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 um, no changes, everything's all the same, same balance, same everything, no activity. Okay, and how about Mandy? Do you have a report for, uh, secretary? I do. Um, I did just want to let um, everyone know that I have a meeting with the captain of the fire station 22, which is also located near that intersection, because um, we want to find out um, what their concerns are with the design of that. Um, and we, you know, as you can see in the letter, we didn't really put specific requests just because the design is quite, um, you know, with the K design, it's, it's a, it's a weird uh, design. So um, I do appreciate your inputs, Brad. Thank you for that information. Um, the only update I have as secretary is that the motion slips, um, I did email everyone. So if you did complete, um, make a motion, I need you to complete those and go ahead and email those so that they are part of the record. And we are in compliance with the city when it comes to our motion slips. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to reach out to me, you know where to find me. Thank you, Mandy. All right, we're going to turn to non-agenda public comment then. Um, do we have any non-agenda public comment tonight? I see Matt, go ahead. Hi, right, yeah, I, I have two things. Um, I'll try to keep it quite brief. And uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to bring up, um, a couple of years ago, I attended some scientific meetings in Australia and I was struck by how every session there, whether it's a large or a small, uh, kind of lecture, we started with an acknowledgement to the Aboriginal custodians of the land there. Um, and, you know, it, it was bigger than just the meetings. Like when I went out to the opera house, you know, they started all the sessions there with that too. Um, it, it, it had an impact on me, you know, kind of even more so than some of the science I went there to discuss. And, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while. And as we're a board that exists to advise the city on land use decisions, I think it would be appropriate to acknowledge, you know, at our meetings that we are here on the ancestral homelands of the Kumihe. So just wanted to say that. And then also wanted to share um, one announcement that I received and I'll paste this in the text as well. But um, there's gonna be a youth transportation forum uh, or uh, rather a town hall on December 2nd from five to 7 p.m. that'll have uh, county supervisors, uh, Sandag board members, and some uh, city council members present. So if you know any <laughs> students who are interested in uh, a transportation town hall, uh, please help share the message and I'll paste some of the info in the chat. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Matt. Um, any other non-agenda public comment? Tracy? Would... Oh. Mm, yeah, so I have, um, I have an announcement or announcements for Ocean Beach Town Council. Um, <laughs> So since I'm on so many boards, I'll just kind of run through them as I can. Um, so the Ocean Beach Town Council is happy to say that we are actually doing our real um, normal Ocean Beach Parade. 
and that is the first Saturday of December. And right now we are looking for um, sponsorships. So we still have some opportunities for tree sponsors. We have opportunities for um, banners along the parade route as well. Um, and of course, if you have a float or you want to march in the parade, you can apply for that. We also are always, always, always in need of volunteers to help with the parade. Um, it's a huge project and we need a lot of manpower to move everybody around. Um, in addition to that, the holiday auction is also coming up. So if you have any uh, thing that you would like to donate to the auction. All the money that is raised goes towards the final initiative of the year, which is the food and toy drive, which um, distributes food and toys to some of our more needy uh, 92107 uh, uh, community members. So if you have any questions, all of the information, the volunteer forms, all of that stuff is on the Ocean Beach Town Council website. And um, it would be great to see you guys out there. And um, I'm director of sponsorships this year. So if you want to do like a tree sponsor or whatever, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Corey. Um, and if you want anything for the auction, I can put you in touch with Cameron, who I believe is in charge of collecting things for the auction. And that is the town council news. Thank you, Tracy. How about Corla? I see you, you got a public comment. I do, thank you. I have a couple of announcements and then uh, my public comment. Um, December 18th, the Rec Center will be having Cookies with Santa this year. They are back open on limited hours. I have those hours I'd be happy to share either in the chat or if anybody wants to contact me. We have new directors who seem really nice. Uh, Mandy and Don and I were just in that meeting and are at the next meeting again, Zoom meeting now. <clears throat> They're uh, looking for staff for the day in summer camps. And uh, they also had uh, information <clears throat> about the pocket park, which I think we can discuss under parks and recs. And I'll let the two, Mandy and Don, <clears throat> take care of that later on. My comment is about 3111 Fenelon. And it's been a, a problem property for a long time, but they've had permits to, to tear down those three houses and put up uh, some units. I just found out recently that they're gonna put 24 units up there. They get a three unit density bonus for affordable. What I found out, and, and that's within their right, that's zoned RM47. What I did find out is that those three density bonus units don't have to be on that site on that property. I also have recently found out, and I'm still in the process of researching and learning the code because it keeps changing. We, you know, we've, we got the C pause for the height in, in this Roseville neighborhood. We've done all kinds of things, but all those rules have changed and they're different now. Uh, the majority of which on that 24 units he's gonna put in don't have to have parking. His permit does ask for parking, but he doesn't have to. So there's a lot of changes and a lot of things going on. And my personal opinion is I'm incensed by the fact that a builder or developer or anybody can put up units, <clears throat> get an affordable density bonus and not have to keep it on site. I, I just think it's wrong. Uh, and also the parking issue is gonna be killing us all soon. So uh, this is my new, I've, I've been known as the parking and the height limit uh, person for many years. And, and in all the projects we ask about parking and we ask about height, and like I said, they can't, manipulate us on height in this area any longer, but the parking is going to be an issue. And especially with the new, you know, you don't have to provide parking and commercial regulations. Um, there's just a lot of stuff going on happening and I'm not happy. And that's all. Thank you very much. Corla, can I ask you a question? This is Margaret. Who's in charge of those advisory board meetings for park and rec down at Cabrillo? Um, do you mean, would you like to be on the email list or something? Is that? Well, I was, and I haven't been the last month or so. Yeah, so they I was have wondering if that's it's, it's a Dolfo. I think Mandy or and has has that uh, contact info. And if she does not, I have a Dolfo's email. I don't have Anna's email, but we oh. can give you that contact info and get you back okay. on the list. I, I I've been on the list and I'm not on it now. So um, there's been a there, there's new staff 
and they're just now getting open. They're open limited hours. So okay, I would love that info, please, because yeah, I'd like to attend those meetings. Thank you. Sure. I, I can get you on it, Margaret. Okay, thank you, Don. All right, Corla, thank you for sharing. We'll try to keep you happy. So uh, any other non-agenda public comment? I don't see any. So with that, then we're gonna to move to government reports. And um, I know that uh, I, I let Cole is gonna to get to go first. He had a, uh, uh, a sick cat today that he, that he overcame to, to still show up here on time. So Cole, you get to kick us off on government reports tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my cat's doing fine, by the way. They're, he just has to go through some testing, but he's doing all right right now. Um, I have a pretty light report today. So um, now that uh, the legislative session for the year is over, it ended on October, the governor acted on all legislation on his desk on October 9th. Um, the senator spent a lot more of her time in the district office, which means our district office is really busy with staffing her on different events. Uh, one event in particular that I know I've spent several work weeks coordinating on is a event for uh, veterans who are experiencing homelessness, those uh, veterans who are unemployed or veterans who are at risk of uh, becoming homeless. It's called Stand Down. That just happened yesterday. And uh, the Senator gave a, a brief speech there, but it's mainly just an event for uh, connecting uh, veterans with basic needs resources, employment resources. Our office actually helped coordinate like a 1500 sock donation. Uh, to that organization, and they really, really appreciated it. It's a good organization. The senator's involved uh, with uh, Veterans Village of San Diego. Uh, that, that's the organization that runs Stand Down. Uh, she's involved with this event every single year. So I always got to do what I can just to um, you know, spread the word out on Stand Down. Um, otherwise, uh, our office is still you know, busy uh, with casework for folks. So if you are having an issue with a state agency, um, you know, DMV, uh, the, the, the EDD, uh, the, uh, the uh, California Department of Consumer Affairs, which does licensing, I cover all those areas. So don't hesitate to send me an email if you need assistance with those. And that's all I have for the night. Uh, thank you for listening to me. All right, well, thank you, Paul. How about um, Andrew on behalf? Oh, are there any questions for Paul? I guess I should just ask that. Don't see any. But uh, so I was going to go to Andrew. How, how about for Supervisor uh, Vargas? Thanks, Fred. Good evening, everyone. Just a few updates at the county level. So boosters are available and appointments can be made at myturn.ca.gov. Um, if you got travel plans coming up and you've lost your uh, vaccine info, the California Department, and he Department of Health um, allows you through a portal to access that. And if you need any help, feel free to reach out to me. I'll throw my uh, email in the chat. Um, and then the San Diego County Board of Supervisors Tuesday voted unanimously to support a congressional bill aimed at prohibiting new offshore oil drilling in Southern California. Uh, and last but not least, uh, there's also an op-ed that was just released by the Tribune that you can check out about Supervisor Vargas and the events that have taken place this month at the Board of Supervisors meeting. Um, they've also, neighborhood reinvestment and community enhancement grant funding still available. Uh, so if you know any nonprofit organizations in the Point Loma area that haven't applied for that, uh, please direct them my way. And I'm happy to guide them through the application process. And then that's pretty much it on my end. Thank you, everyone. All right, Andrew, I got a couple of questions for you. I, you know, I'm, I've obviously been a big proponent all the way through since I, I know my, I have people in my family that are at risk to, of vaccination. So just I, at first I'll report I got my booster and uh, it was Moderna and it kicked my ass. So anyway, I'm feeling better now, but uh, I'm glad I got it. My sh sh shoulder was sore there for a few days. And I might contact you though about that vaccination information. I have my card. I, I guard it uh, jealously because it's important and I've got lots of pictures of it, but um, I found it kind of annoying that, that they totally scribbled on my card. So you can't even read my name. So I, I tried to log on to the state site to get my information and, and I don't think they have my name spelled correctly in there because it's all scribbled in there. So uh, I, might, I might contact you to see if I can figure out to get that straightened out. Paul? Yeah, Fred, um, when I tried to get on to the, the state registry so I could have it on my phone, the actual QR code, yeah. for the first four weeks or so, I, it was not available. 
And I, so I stopped and I waited about another month and then finally put in the same information. It was fine. They're just really backlogged. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's it too. Okay, fair enough. Anyway, I encourage everybody to get vaccinated and I encourage those that have been vaccinated to get the booster. That's, I'm not going to mandate it, but I'm going to encourage it. <laughs> All right, let's go local. Uh, District 2, uh, Monique, on behalf of uh, Jen Campbell, are you, uh, do you have a report? I do. Um, so with the weather getting cooler and hopefully we get more rain, uh, I just want to remind everybody that there is a rain barrel rebate program. So um, you could go ahead and purchase a rain barrel that the city would provide like a rebate for. And then you could collect your rain and use it for other purposes, watering your garden um, and doing other things like that. Um, just to conserve water, we are in a drought, even though the city of San Diego does not have those mandates to um, conserve water like other cities in the state. Um, I just want to remind everybody about the program. So if you guys want to take advantage of it, it is there and I'll provide a link where you could go ahead and apply for it. And then I do want to share the launch of this really cool program. It's called Discover and Go. So it allows uh, San Diego Public library card holders to use your library card to reserve passes to places like the new Children's Museum, the Museum of Us, even the San Diego Zoo. Uh, this is a new program that was just launched, so I want to make sure that everybody takes advantage of this because it's a really cool opportunity to go to museums for free. Um, you just have to go to this website and book your pass to just start using um, and taking advantage of that new program. And then lastly, uh, the release of the updated climate action plan is now live. I'll provide a link for you all there. You guys could read the draft, provide comments um, at that link. City staff will also be holding a public forum on Thursday, December 2nd at 6 p.m. and Saturday, December 4th at 9 a.m. Um, they are going to have translation services as available in Spanish, uh, Tagalog, and then Vietnamese and Chinese as well. So if you want to learn more, I'll also provide a link so you guys can sign up. And then just a reminder that the street vendor ordinance is going to be coming to council December 14th, 2021. Um, this is where the city council members were going to be discussing the proposed street vendor ordinance. Um, we don't have a draft out yet. I have not seen it. As soon as it is available to our office, we'll go ahead and share it with the community so you guys could review that. And is there any questions? Well, I know Margaret my, has my, one. My, friend, my friends in Ocean Beach are really worried about those tree vendors. So I encourage you guys to, to stay on that. But I'm sorry, other people have questions? Go ahead. Go I on. wanted to ask Monique a question in regards to the notice of public hearing that wasn't mentioned for District 2 the appeal to planning commission on December 2nd in regards to Nimitz crossing? Yes, so with the process, we did get some inqu inquiries about that. Um, there was an appeal to the planning commission. Um, it is a process too, so this is not gonna come before the city council for a vote. Um, it's gonna be made, a decision's gonna be made through a hearing officer, which is an independent officer. So an administrative ear hearing officer who will listen to both sides and then make a decision. I have not heard of when that is gonna come forward or if there's a date for that hearing yet. There's a hearing scheduled for that Nimitz crossing. I sent the email to everybody on December 2nd. Yes, and that's a, an opportunity for the public to provide comment as well. And make an appeal. I, I don't know if they're voting on that then or not, but that's the date for the hearing. Yeah. I, um, Don, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, Monique, something that's near and dear to this board and to the Point Loma Association is the improvement of the Voltaire Street Bridge. Uh, the actual drawings, material, and so forth were submitted by Joel Alasic in April or whatever. We really haven't heard anything. Have you had a chance to talk with Aldo Draghi of the city and, and what the hang up is with the city? So we did look into the permit that was filed. Um, the confusion there was that it needed to have a whole construction change. Obviously, the, the project was completed. So that was where the confusion did lie. Um, they're going to reach out to Joe 
directly and kind of figure things out. I haven't had the opportunity to connect with Joe yet to see if they've reached out to him and if um, he have any further assistance with this. Um, I was planning on calling him tomorrow to give it a few days for him to connect with city staff. And then going forward from what I hear back from him, if he needs further direction, if he needs further help, then I'll go ahead and step in more. Well, he's on this, he's on this Zoom video. He's not heard from the city. To he has I, I got Do your emails today. Thank you so much. And yeah. I'll look forward to talking with you tomorrow. Yeah, it's not a construction change because it's complete. We don't, mm -hmm. the engineers who did the work don't have record of it because it's a city project. So it's just kind of lost in the ether out there. I think you and I can straighten it out fairly quickly. Yeah, and they did, so they did uh, confirm that it does not require construction change. So that is good news. They did confirm that with me and they wanted to speak with you since you were the applicant who mm -hmm. filed the permit. Okay, right. well, we'll straighten it out. I look forward to talking to you. Great. Andy, do you have a question for Monique? I guess just to follow up, I had sent you some emails regarding the original letter that was sent to the to the council member in February regarding Froud Street. Um, the intent of the board was to override the city council policy for stop signs, and I was waiting to hear back from you about if the council member was willing to override the city council policy for that original request. We are looking into it. So I think um, one of the emails did mention the OB planning group did write a letter. I can't locate mm -hmm. that. If you could send that to me, that'd be great. I sent you an email today um, asking if you have a copy of that, if you could send it. Because when we do usually override city council policy, we need to um, make reference to the dates and any votes that were coming from the planning boards and send it over to the department. Do you have that information, Tracy, for her to provide? Um, and is it an actual letter or does it come in the form of a motion when Andrea sends it to the city? Um, usually, I think it's a it's a letter that she sends. So she would probably have a copy of that somewhere. Okay. All right, well. Um, what's, your name? Think, what's her last name, Tracy? Uh, Tracy. Oh, it, it wouldn't come from me, it would come from Andrea. Okay, I, I could check with her too. Okay. Any other questions for Monique? One quick one, Monique. Uh, when you get a chance again, could you look into the parking enforcement again down on in front of the post office on Cannon? Yes, is there issues again? Yes, very much so. They did send some people out for a day or so, but then they vanished. Okay, I could go ahead and request there's some parking enforcement there. On a lighter level, I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you, Monique. Appreciate your, your input. DK, you want to give us an update on Midway? Yeah. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm feeling a little under weather, so I'm tucked up in bed, but I am listening uh, attentively. Um, yeah, we had our, our uh, what is it, November meeting just yesterday, and a couple things that came up. Primarily, what was interesting is you guys are familiar with the BevMo that's right there on Rosecrans. Apparently, the BevMo business has been bought by another company called GoPuff. And one of the things that they offer is uh, alcohol delivery. And so they had an amendment to their uh, CUP that came in front of us as an action yesterday that we supported. I mean, it's normal store hours. They're, they're not changing any products. But what they do is apparently uh, they keep a somewhere between two to five mile radius uh, around any given store. They offer uh, under 30 minutes of delivery for anything that they sell in their store. So that came in front of us. Uh, outside of that action, it's been quiet in the community uh, these last few weeks. We're certainly tracking the redistricting process, uh, both at the state and uh, the county and also the city council level uh, across the board. So I appreciate uh, all the work you're doing there on, on that front, Fred. It's good to see you when I watch those things. Uh, voice of reason out there. Other than that, like I said, you know, we're continuing to keep tabs on the whole uh, sports arena development. That window opened uh, before the last time I came before you was. But I think on December 3rd is the date that the uh, submission window closes for, for any of those folks uh, who are interested in redeveloping the arena. So nothing new on that front. Um, other than that, like I said, quiet in the neighborhood. Okay, well, thank you, DK. I just, just for your information, I did actually get approached by one of the groups that's putting in a submission for uh, for redeveloping the sports arena and they wanted to they wanted to make a half an hour presentation but I told them my agenda was too full so <clears throat> they're going to come back if they get it so we'll, we'll talk to them if they get it but uh, you know we're, we're going to continue to to keep an eye on that sports arena development so thank I'll you do that. no no thank you 
All right, uh, Tracy, did you have anything else from Ocean Beach? Yeah, um, I'm gonna I'll, I'll the Ocean Beach thing, and then I'll I'll just have a brief announcement for the Commission for Arts and Culture. Um, so last month we had a presentation by the city for the new Ocean Beach Library. And um, for those of you who were not there, the community seemed very um, disappointed that they did not get a chance to chime in to the plans of the library. And um, the presentation was a little odd because it seemed like all they had were firm designs or sort of firm designs for the patio that they were going to have, the outdoor courtyard. Um, but there was not a lot of firm designs shown for the actual building or the, um, you know, they, they just kind of gave concepts. They didn't really give a firm design. Um, so that made people a little bit grumpy too. I, I think maybe they thought that they were wasting their time because they didn't really get to see anything that they could comment on. Um, so I heard that they're, they're trying to figure out when to do a public meeting for that and invite the community for feedback. Um, I'm not exactly sure, sure when that's gonna happen. The Friends of the Library have been taking the lead on this. And of course they have been putting in a lot of their time over the last few years, um, suggesting you know things for the layout and that kind of stuff. But I don't think it ever made it to the public as a whole. So um, a lot of people were very disappointed and um, it seemed, to be a very cranky meeting, but you know, that's OB, we wanna be involved in everything. So um, I think it was really important that the city showed up before they did anything, um, but they're gonna have to step it up a little bit so that, you know, OB can have their say. Um, regarding the Arts and Culture Commission, uh, let's see. So the San Diego Commission for Arts and Culture is, is like, it would still like to remind everyone that the application period remains open until November 21st for those wishing to volunteer as funding application review panelists for the fiscal year 23 funding cycle. So if you or someone you know is an artist, cultural practitioner or arts field professional um, from any discipline and background, I'm going to put a link in the chat so that um, you guys can apply for that. It's, uh, it's of course, another volunteer opportunity, but it really helps the commission with deciding who gets funding every year. And it's great if we could have uh, applicant reviewers who are in the same disciplines as the applicants. So um, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. I think that I've got all the government uh, people that I, that are here. So if I if I missed anybody, let me know. Otherwise, we are going to move on to our bread and butter, and go to Joe and try to get a couple of these projects uh, reviewed and voted on tonight. So first one looks to be uh, forty two sixty eight Orchard. So Joe, you get to take it over. You bet. Thank you so much, uh, Fred. So <clears throat> the first um, project that we have is a small remodel. It's again at forty two sixty. 68 Orchard Avenue, um, and also the addition of a an ADU. Um, it's an alley. Uh, it's a property that has a you know street and an alley exposure, so it's a, one of the better suited lots for an ADU expansion. Um, the applicant is Abbas. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, Abbas. I don't want to butcher it, butcher it, but I think it's. Kaisha Varzi. Anyway, he is on the phone with us, has been waiting patiently. He's been before the project review a couple of times. We did have him clarify some items that we weren't certain on, um, specifically some clearances for some power poles. We also had him look at um, the architecture of the project a little bit, and he's done so per our request. And so, uh, Abbas, with that, why don't you briefly uh, present your project to the group. I think we're already a little bit behind schedule, but if you could briefly present your project to the group and then we'll open it for any questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, Abbas. We are doing uh, remodeling existing house and adding a garage and an Monique needs to mute herself because you're getting feedback. Uh, I think 
Uh, boss, do you have your applicants with you? Are, are there other people in the room on the call on different devices? Yeah, the owner is here. Yeah, are you on different devices or just one computer? No. We are, I muted it now. Okay, she, she Yeah, there you go, that's enough. what it is. That's the Thank feedback. Thank you. Now you can go. Yeah. Did you hear me or you want me to try again? You're good now, keep going. Okay, yeah, we're adding a couple hundred square feet to the existing house, remodel the existing house, and adding a three-car garage, an ADU above the garage, uh, approximately 560, 70 square feet. Can you briefly show us the drawings, please, Abbas? Let me open it up. Can you see that? That's the uh, you part. need to do share screen. Go back to the video. Thank you. I've got you it right that. there. Oh, yeah. I, I pulled it up, guys, and I oh, can thank scroll. You. Yeah, it's right here, and I'll scroll as you wish. Okay. This, this here is the ADU. That's the existing house. This is a new patio addition and a little addition here. And the next page is floor plans. That's the main house existing floor plan. And this is the new floor plan with addition, three bedrooms, living room, a patio cover here. And the next page is elevations. These are the main house elevations. This is the front elevation with a nice porch here. And this is the rear elevation, side elevations for main house. And then the next page is ADU and garage. This is the ADU floor plan. One bedroom, one bath, kitchen and living room, three car garage. And these are the side elevations. And rear elevation toward the existing house, and this is the elevation toward the alley. And this is the roof plan and demolition plan. It's not a bit. That's the roof plan for ADU, and this is the existing house roof plan. Let me see if anybody has a question. Look after if they have any questions. If, any, any, if you have any question, please. Would anyone like to see any of these pages again? I think we, I think we can get out of the screen share and let's, let's see if we have, anybody has any questions. Um, Angela? I noticed that it was a five to one. Is Can you share why the one was not in favor? Can you respond to that, Joe? Um, I'm trying to remember who the person not in favor was. Corla, do you recall? Yeah, it was Brad was a no. Yeah, I thought I so. Uh, Brad, do you, you want to share with us why you weren't in favor of this? Um, the front elevation is really similar to the property that a boss did down the street. I mean, I know that this is a Spanish. It's a 43, but... 42, 30. Right, right. I, I just, I rarely will make a decision on, you know, that it meets all the criteria. I just, I didn't like the project. All right, just, Joe, what, what was the general feeling then of the, uh, the five that voted for? Yeah. Well, the general feeling, Fred, <laughs> is that um, a boss followed all of the rules. He had a compliant AD. Uh, ADU. Um, he has in excess of the parking requirements. He's actually adding parking. He pulled the ADU off of the alley to um, soften the abruptness of it on the alley and to separate it a little bit from some existing overhead power lines. Uh, and he worked with us uh, somewhat to improve the front elevation of the house. Again, Brad lives very, very close to this, and he apparently did a similar, very similar AD or very similar remodel on a house. 
within a couple of blocks. That was sort of extraneous to us because I don't have any, you know, I can't say you can't do this because you did it a block or two away. So I think that was sort of the consensus of the group. But again, he, he, he worked with us uh, and he also followed all of the rules and he's adding parking. So we felt that it, you know, it, it merited being approved. Uh, Nicole, did you have a question? Thank you. You're muted, Nicole. Sorry. Uh, just a comment and to Voss and when you're creating this project, which uh, I can understand why it's not totally favorable, but um, my comment is to water. So I have an 1800 gallon water tank and the time to put in an underground water tank is when the project is being built. And when you can capture 600 square feet of one inch of rain will capture 600 gallons. I mean, the math is makes sense to put in a rain tank underground as your project is being built. And so that's meant for you. Thank you. Okay. Margaret has a question whenever you have a chance for it. Okay, uh, Don had his hand up. So we're gonna go to Don and then we'll go to you, Margaret. Yeah, you know, the front of the house is kind of mid-century modern. Is that architecture gonna remain? It's a Spanish thought. Yeah, it's kind of Spanish looking now, Don, and kind of, kind of, if you had to uh, give it a, a architectural style. And it's, he's sort of improving the Spanish style look of the house. It's not heavy Spanish, but it, you know, it's kind of consistent with a lot of the houses of that era that you see in Point Loma. And Margaret, did you have a question? Uh, more of a comment. I realize that sometimes these votes and these committee meetings, the five to one is because, you know, you're you're basically saying because he did it to one home close by, it's an exception, but we really have to keep in mind Brad's concern and I'm sure other neighbors. Um, and, and with the first project, it obviously didn't come to us and this one is. So that to me is always a red flag and uh, why they need our support to, so, to approve this project. So just keeping that in mind. We did see the other one too. <laughs> Sam, do you got a question? No, I, no, it's more of a comment. I particularly want to compliment this applicant and owner for the uh, added parking space, which uh, I think is something very good for the community. And I'm very concerned about what parking is going to look like in a few I years. I provided four parking, three car garage and one open space. Right. It's very good. I mean, I think that was good for the application. And you know, for ADU, parking is not required. We just did yes. this. That's not entirely true. If it's no, in a, right. the priority area, it's not required. So that's not in. No, no, no. Like right now, that. if you look at the uh, information bulletin 400, City of San Diego, they revised it. Parking is not required. Even if you convert your garage to an ADU, you don't have to provide parking. If you get a chance, please read the information bulletin 400, please. All right, well, we've had some discussion. Does somebody want to make a motion to uh, approve this uh, project? Um, I'll make a motion to approve the project. Okay, motion to approve by Sam, second by Paul. All right, um, I'm going to, you know, I think that we're encouraged to call the roll. So I'm going to go ahead and call the roll. And you, if you're in favor of the project, vote yes. And if you're against it, you vote no. So I'm just going to go down my list, Margaret. Okay, I come back to Margaret yes. Pratt. Yes, Pratt. I agree. I am. Go ahead, um, Margaret. Yes. Yes. Okay, Brad. I'll be consistent and uh, vote no again. Um, Corla. Yes. Mandy. Yes. Don. No. Robert. Yes. Angela. Yes. Nicole. Yes. Matt. Yes. Joe. Yes. 
Sam? Yes. Paul? Yes. All right, one, two, three. Ten to two. Ten to ten, ten to two, it is passed. So congratulations. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, Joe, the next project is uh, on Adair Street. Yes, it is. So yeah. the next- You can leave. You can leave. You can leave. No. You're free. Thank, Thank you, you, boss. Thank you, everyone. Okay, the next project is at 4675 Adair Street. The applicant is Lee Hope. This is another coastal development permit as many of them are these days for the remodel of an existing single family residence. Um, and the addition of 761 square feet to the first level and 1183 square feet to the second story with a roof deck. Um, this is technically a remodel, but it's basically a tear down and reconstruct. They are mainly leaving the portion of the existing house for the foundation uh, to minimize construction costs. But Lee has um, uh, put together what we think is a nice project. So Lee, why don't you uh, take it from here and walk the group quickly through it on, on screen share. Great, I will do that. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Lee Hope, uh, architect in Point Loma. Uh, this is on the uh, lower part of Adair, a couple blocks from, uh, from uh, Sunset Cliffs. Um, it's an existing single family house. And uh, I did, uh, I'm going to use my cursor so you can see. This is the remodeled house or expanded house, I should say. This is the existing garage. And this is a guest quarters that I did uh, probably, I don't know, seven years ago, something like that. Uh, the uh, total square footage here, we're looking at the, uh, the total property is 6,900. The floor area ratio is 4,007. Our total site square footage is 3,797. So we're a couple hundred square feet under the max FAR. Uh, the existing residence, as Joe pointed out, was 1050 the, the floor plate. I'm going to go, I'm going to move here to the dem, to, I'm sorry, I went to one, to the demolition plan, which is, this is the existing house, which we're pretty much removing. We, we decided, well, at this point, we've decided to keep the existing floor, floor ply. It's in, it's in good shape. The perimeter foundation, not much of it will probably be used, but it, it does create a nice platform to build upon. Here's the existing two-car garage showing the sizes of the spaces. Here is the existing guest quarters and an unimproved alley in the back. Existing driveway to the existing garage. Here's the uh, ground floor plan. As you can see, the existing driveway going to the garage back here. An improved entry area to an entry and then a two-story space into the living, kitchen and dining back here onto a deck going to the backyard. Uh, bedroom here, master bedroom and all that stuff here and stairways up. Small wall, uh, garden wall here uh, under the three foot height limit and some landscape buffering and that kind of thing. If you look closely at this dashed line here, it's right here. This is the outline of the existing residence. So it's pretty much expanding on all sides. Uh, second level, go up the stairs to game room, den, out to a deck. We have a basically a three story or a two story, um, a circular stair, which goes up to the second level deck from the ground floor and also up to the roof deck. Kids bedrooms up here, look over into the space here. Up, up the circular stair to the roof deck, which is just this portion here. And this is standard, uh, this is two-story roof here, two-story roof here, and a single level roof here. So we go to the elevations. As you can see, this is the 30-foot height limit line here. So we're underneath the height limit by um, about five feet. Um, 
this is the front entry. This is looking from Adair Street. So this is the front entry uh, and a, uh, anyway, two story element and then it sweeps back and this sits, sits back, roof deck sits back as well. This is the, whoops, the west elevation. There will be a lot of planting in front of here. There's good landscape possibilities to buffer this side of the house. South elevation, this is the rear part. And I'm sorry, this is the one, the east I meant as the buffer with all the landscape to scale this down a little bit. It's, you know, it's not close to property line or anything like that, so it's not too bad. And then your sections, this is the guest quarters, the existing garage and the uh, structure. And that's just cross section. And I have a little front rendering for you to see. And that's just what it's more or less gonna, that, that's basically what it is from the street side, um, from the street side. And I can take questions. Looks like a pretty good project to me. What did, what did you think of it, Joe? Or what did the committee think of it? Uh, the committee was in favor of it. They think Lee did a nice job. He did. And, um, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a very nice house. It's clearly two and a half times the house that's there right now. But again, they've done an, a, you know, a small, um, not an ADU, but what was then at the time, a kind of a granny flat it's, in the yeah, back. Guest quarters. And yeah, guest quarters. And during this process, it would be easy for them to convert that into an ADU because now obviously they're legal now and they, nope, we want to keep it a guest quarters, which is very rare. So <laughs> it's a guest quarters. No, but we think right, it's a nice get out of the screen share so I can see if anybody has any questions and then we can, uh, we can move okay. this one forward. All right. Here, hang on. How do I do that? And while you're doing that, Lee, I also make the comment that I, I like it when you're when you're four or five feet below the uh, 30 foot height limit. I, 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 it always bothers me when people go to 29 feet, 11 inches. But uh, <laughs> so thank well, you. Yeah, you, you do that when you have three story buildings because you have to. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Fred, if there's no questions, I'll move forward with a motion. OK, I got a motion by Margaret. I uh, got a second. Uh, I got Robert Jackson as a second. Any other any other questions? All right, um, just as move this one along, seems like this one's uh, non-controversial. All those in favor, raise your hands. Margaret says yes. Yes, thank you, Margaret, I appreciate that. It appears to be unanimous to me, so 12 nothing. Thank you. Good job, Lee. Thank you very much, you guys. Have a good night. Thank you, Lee. All right, Joe, you got Navarra Street. We've got a, another, another coastal development permit at 1070. Novara Street. This is basically the conversion of an existing 527 square foot rear alley garage into a one bedroom ADU. Uh, the applicant is Jeff Parcell or Parcel. I'm not sure how you pronounce your name, Jeff. I'm sorry. I'm not good with names tonight, I guess. Um, anyway, he did the, Jeff did the, a major over, a major remodel to the house that is in front of this property, did a very nice job and a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I think. And now they're just adding this small ADU in the back. So Jeff, I think I see you online somewhere. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. Okay. I apologize again for messing up your last That's name. Fine. How do you pronounce it? It's Parshall. Parshall. Okay. All right, so I'll do share screen here. If I'm, okay. hope I can do this. Okay, everybody can see that okay? Uh -huh. Okay, good. So uh, this is the property. Um, the main home uh, is here in the front up in Navarro and it has a two car garage. Uh, the property drops down to the rear to an unimproved alley, which is basically dirt and gravel. And there's an existing uh, garage here, not quite wide enough for, for two cars. Um, and that's being converted to a one bedroom ADU. Um, here's the outside of it. Uh, the, the front of it that faces the alley this is where the garage door is now. That'll be infilled with the window and a door. The existing side door here will be removed and replaced with a window. And on the other side, there's a bedroom window that needs to be modified to comply with uh, egress requirements. So it's pretty straightforward. We're not 
doing much to the outside, uh, new roofing and repainting, and that's pretty much it. And then these changes to the openings. Um, so that's that's basically it. It's a very modest uh, little addition to the house. It is on a very narrow, unimproved alley. So it, parking is really technically infeasible off the rear as we see it. Uh, would you concur with that, Jeff? Yeah, um, parking on an unimproved alley is not required for an ADU. As you can see, the house does have um, an exist, or the garage does have uh, an existing setback from the alley. So it would be possible to smart park a small car in a parallel fashion there if, if need be. Um, but that doesn't comply with you know the required size of the city parking parking space. So um, we will be allowed to use the existing driveway to provide the legal uh, parking space for the uh, ADU. All right. Well, if we can get out of the screen share, then Joe, uh, why don't you just give an overview of? of uh, I think it was six to nothing at project review. So, what do you guys think? And do you have recommendations? Uh, Fred, we think that this was a, a very modest uh, addition to the house. It will be a, a nice little structure. It's not tall. It's not. It's not uh, uh, doing anything that's against any of the rules. And we think that um, Jeff did a very nice job on the remodel of the front facing house, the street facing house, uh, very nice residence. So I'm sure that this will complement the existing residence and uh, basically replace a pretty, pretty broken down little garage that's sitting back off this dirt alley. So the group was in favor of it. He did a nice job. All right, do we have a motion then on this one? Margaret makes a motion. Thank you, Margaret. Is any Second. Angela seconds? Is there any discussion? All right. All those in favor, go ahead and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you, Margaret. Aye. I appreciate that. And it again appears to be 12 nothing. So perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jeff. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. We like those well done projects. Well, great Thank job, you, Project Jeff. Review. Yeah. Thanks, Margaret. All right, well, let's move on to informational items. That was good. I'm glad we, we got through those projects. That was good. I, uh, you did, Project Review is doing a great job, and I, I understand you guys got a backlog, so good, good luck with that. Lots of ADUs coming our way. Yeah. Well, we're going to probably talk about that when it comes to the letter here in the second one. But Correct. let's just start with the CPC. Corla, I, I, I saw some interesting stuff you circulated about uh, Joe LaCava and, and CPC and things that may affect the, the future of uh, planning board. So what, what's going on with the CPC? Well, I circulated all the information from uh, CPC chair about what's coming up for discussion. It won't be next week, it'll be on the 30th. And Joe LaCava has been working on this for quite a while. Um, it, I've been saying all along, they're trying to get rid of, of uh, community planning groups, but uh, there's big changes. They, they've determined that we've been operating illegally and uh, you just have to read all of that information. It's too much to go into and discuss. Um, my questions that I will be presenting will be, uh, will, will we still have a place to review projects, which is our function? How, how will they uh, uh, take, is that gonna be part of the, the process that they have to come before us or are they eliminating that? Because uh, that's in the cycle issues, and also uh, will uh, the membership, the volunteer membership of the CPGs, be indemnified? And I'm just asking for any kind of input or discussion that the group might want me to take and find out at uh, this month's CPC meeting. Well, I would. Um, I'm gonna let go, Paul. Why don't you go ahead? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Fred. Uh, th there's a number of things in here that I find absolutely chilling. Uh, for one, the, the city attorney can bring uh, misdemeanor charges against a planning board member if this is approved as it is for violations of the Brown Act. I've, in all my years working for Brown Act uh, governed uh, bodies, I've never heard anyone getting uh, uh, a criminal prosecution. For another, there, there's a proposal in there to have council members appoint additional planning board members, uh, even above the, the uh, ones that are voted on by the community. Uh, there's a real complications in the, in the voting 
itself, the elections, there, there's, th th this is going to be super changes to how we do business. It's pretty serious. Yeah. Uh, Don, go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree with Sam. Um, Joe LaCava was a chair of a, of a planning board. I, I'm not sure whether he's pushing this or just writing it. The uh, deputy city attorney, who is a specialist on the Brown Act, mm -hmm. says, uh, although this says they may bring criminal charges, says it just isn't done. If someone violates the Brown Act, it's done as a civil matter, not criminal. I'm with Sam. I, this is horrible. Yeah. So I think like Paul, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we, we can't really form a committee, but I, I think that Corla would welcome help and, and your input on that. And um, if you could work with her, I think that there's, we're certainly concerned of anything that would, would really drastically uh, impact the, the local planning boards and our ability to be autonomous. And, and those are, those are very legitimate concerns that you pointed out. So I, I think we to the extent that you feel comfortable, Corla, expressing our concerns on those issues, I, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I'd like to make a clarification to what Don said. Joe LaCava is not behind this. He's been mediating for us. Joe LaCava was, was uh, represented La Jolla for many years, and he was CPC chair for many years. And now he sits on City Council District 1. So he's been mediating and trying to make this I think as easy as possible on us because I think he believes in com community planning groups and wants to still see us have a function. So he's not pushing this. This isn't his agenda. I think he, this is just sort of a draft that we're going to get to have input on. And uh, then he can take that back to city council and try to advocate for us. That's how I see it. Yeah. And I mean, I think the Brown Act thing is kind of a, a symbolic. I mean, there's a lot of volunteers. We're, we're doing really well. The board's our board's doing great these days, but we've seen in, you know, four or five years ago when people were excited about issues, there was lots of times when people talked about issues in multiple conversations and, and potential issues of the Brown Act. And, and we're all just volunteers, right? We're all volunteers. Nobody's getting paid for this. We're all just trying to make a difference in the community. So threatening people with Brown Act sanctions is, seems seems draconian to me. So And they, and they want us on our own. We're get, we'll be self-governing, self self everything it's like they want to separate us completely so hence my my concern about indemnification and you know this and that and these are questions that we need to ask at, at the meeting on the 30th so all right i see a question from the public from we got paul jameson yeah i'm sorry I, I missed the beginning part of this conversation but you know i attend a lot of planning group meetings i'm a member of bike san diego and i support additional housing in san diego and I'm guessing some of this is just based out of the issues of representation on the boards, right? I mean, there have been studies that have shown that community planning groups are usually older and whiter and wealthier than the neighborhoods that they represent. Um, in Kensington, Talmadge, where I live, we have about 10, 15 people who turn out for the elections. And then you have this group that's sort of advocating on behalf of the entire community. We do have elected representatives. I think we had 85% turnout for our D9 representatives. So I'm guessing that's where some of this is coming from, but I did miss the, the early part of this conversation. And I would love to see some of these reforms to get more representation. If that's what this is about, then I would support it. All right, well, thank you, Paul. Go ahead, Paul Webb. Yeah, and um, what this came out of was a grand jury report that said, in essence, the planning boards are uh, out of control and they're governed or dominated by old white people who own homes, which is probably true. Uh, I don't know when we have a community like ours, which is very diverse, we do do outreach for the elections. If people uh, with underrepresented communities don't run for the board, they can't be on the board. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that what can be done in any meaningful way to, to uh, correct this. I mean, we, we are self-selecting. We, we have concerns about our community and we care for our community and we stand, step forward and take the time and, and effort to run for election and participate in these wonderfully exciting meetings. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that we should be faulted for that. Yeah. And I'd like to I say we have a big turnout. Margaret, you may remember the numbers better than I about our uh, uh, election, our, our drop off the ballot election last year and how many ballots you guys counted. I mean, it was, it's, it was an amazing turnout in our neighborhood, so. Let's just say it took two days. 
to count the votes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Lots of passion. Yeah. Well, but, yeah. So Paul, I, 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 you know, to extend it, Paul, whether you have time to, to work with Paula and, and, and uh, help her on that, that, I appreciate that. I like invite anybody to the meeting um, and, you know, uh, on the 30th, the CPC meeting, uh, and I'll, when I get the link in the agenda and stuff, I will forward that to the board. Yeah, and, and, and Fred, I'd be happy to. Thank and you, just Paul. to comment on, on Corla stuff, because I've attended the CPC mm -hmm. meetings as well, and they're trying to get rid of it. Like you said, Corla, self, you know, we're, we're going to do our own bylaws, our own rules, our own elections. They just really pretty much don't want to babysit anymore. It, it's It's what it sounded like at that one meeting that they really focused on on this issue was basically that they're just getting too many complaints too many the the city employees are, are just getting pulled into too many nonsense complaints when a lot of these planning boards can just deal with it themselves following and governing through their own bylaws and rules is is i i kind of got that's what seems to be the case in bringing this up I know we're wasting Tony Kenton's time, you know. Yes, meetings, you said right? it. You yeah. said it, Brad. I, didn't I mean, I think I've seen him in did. six years. I've seen him twice. Right. Two times in six years. Yeah. Yeah. We're All wasting. right. Well, let's let's move on to the next informational item. Joe, I, I, I think there's a lot of interest in the ADU and project review. So uh, I know you're going to have a special meeting at three o'clock on December 2nd. Um, can you can you tell everybody a little bit about that and and, and what, what's going to happen? Sure, sure. Um, and other members of the project review committee, feel free to chime in. But basically, we received a letter from the La Jolla Community Planning Board, uh, which outlined their recommendations to the city for modifying ADU policy, and we put this. Uh, as an agendized item, uh, not this month, but the previous month. And, um, and by the time we finished our meetings, which have been taking like an hour and a half for project review, we decided that we needed to potentially hold a special project review committee meeting to discuss just this topic. And since December is typically a, uh, a silent month from PCPB, December the 2nd seemed like a date that worked for everyone and was appropriate to devote a whole meeting to discuss any comments that Point Loma might have regarding the ADU policy. As soon as we started talking about that, it became apparent that, as you just indicated, Fred, a number of people are keenly interested in making suggestions regarding ADU policy. So, Corla, uh, agenda or Corla and the group recommended that we bring it before this committee tonight to discuss how we proceed with that meeting. And I think our goal, Mark, Mark Krensick is on the committee and he's, he's instrumental in a lot of these and he, he really knows uh, his stuff. You know, things are changing so rapidly, but our goal, I think, is to draft a letter and Paul has agreed to, Paul Webb has agreed to uh, work on that and, and get us started on that, but draft a letter with our, our position because we don't completely agree with the La Jolla letter. Everybody's seen that letter a month or two months ago. I can't remember when it was circulated and, and you're forgiven if you don't remember because it's forgettable, but um, we want to draft a position, I think, of what meets Point Loma, uh, Peninsula, you know, this area's needs. And so I think that was uh, kind of our goal is to give our input to the city. One brief example uh, is that for uh, in the La Jolla letter, they recommended limiting the height of ADUs to 16 feet. And in Point Loma, we would be specifically against that because it would mean that more lot coverage would occur because garages couldn't be couldn't have ADUs built on top of them. So we think that that's bad policy, and um, you know we recognize that. We don't have large, large lots in Point Loma in many cases. So building or minimizing the footprint of the built environment on your lot is probably more than not a good thing, even though you're building on top of garages. So you're often against the, 
the, the height limit. So, you know, there's a number of things to discuss. Um, height is just one of them, parking and a whole slew of other things come into play. So, yeah. I guess, I guess one of the issues that I have, I want to make sure that we are consistent with the Brown Act. And so is there, I mean, because I would think there could be a lot of people that may want to show up, although I don't know if people can show, how many people will show up at three o'clock, but um, is there, do we have concerns that there's a Brown Act issue if more than, I guess it would be more than a quorum, right? It would, if there's eight board members that show up, is that, does that create an issue with the Brown Act? We've discussed this in past meetings, and the thought is, is if there's a, a quorum established that the board members can participate, but they won't be able to speak or vote if there is a quorum issue. Correct. Yeah, thank you. You guys are right. Okay. Okay. Well, then, as long as we have that understanding, I mean, obviously, I want the people that are on project review, they should definitely be able to speak and we should have and, and other people up to seven should speak and others can, can listen in. But um, I mean, I would encourage, you know, people to intend if they're if they're interested. Margaret, I see your hand up there. So if you want to add a comment. Um, yeah, I do. I have a question for Joe. I, I'm concerned. I, I get so many emails as well. And I've got to forward some to you, Joe, in regards yeah. to projects popping up constantly in Roseville and Point Loma that don't come to us. And has the coastal guidelines gone out the door? I mean, are we grouped in now with all of San Diego as far as protection goes for all these ADU, you know, projects? I mean, what's in it for the coast? Uh, Margaret, I think you just dropped off right at the end there. Did you, did you get that? Uh, I heard what's in it for the coastal and then you kind of cut out. I was just saying, do we have? Per <laughs> okay, you cut out again, Margaret. Uh, well, I know growing up in a coastal community, developers can do and can't do. And it just seems lately, the last year or two, that's gone out the door. We have nothing except barely the 30 foot height limit and the only way in and out of Point Loma right now is Rosecrans, barely Nimitz. And with all these ADUs coming in and more people coming in to the point, are you able to answer if we've got any kind of guidelines we could stick to on this planning board? Well, I would probably answer that question with a question to Fred among, among the project review committee members who were present tonight. but. I don't think so. I think it's citywide policy and they're not differentiating Point Loma from any of the other communities right now. And I'm, and I'm just saying coastal, coastal communities, not just Point Loma, but La Jolla, Mission Beach, Ocean Beach, you know, all the coastal communities. Paul Webb, do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah. And, and the answer to that, as far as I understand it, is uh, many of the changes that are being proposed are citywide changes but they cannot be applied in the coastal zone until the LCP has been um, um, amended to include changes to the city's land development code. Now, in the past, the city has been, I'll say a little cavalier about uh, enforcing or not enforcing things that had not yet come before the commission, um, but legally that is how it's, it is supposed to occur. So the, it's a citywide policy, but until the commission has the uh, chance to review and take action on the changes in the land development code, they do not apply in the coastal zone. Thank you, Paul. And Paul, just as a question, the coastal overlay zone, which has the map, which has the fairly expensive fee for the majority of Point Loma, I don't know if that sort of a fee exists in other communities in Pacific Beach or La Jolla, but as you're all aware, there's like a $15,000 coastal development application project fee. And it, if you look at the map of the Point Loma Peninsula, it covers probably 90% of the peninsula. Um, I don't know what the fee structure is now, but that's the city imposed fee, not, a, not the coastal commission's imposed fee. Very few projects these days go in front of the commission itself, unless they're between the first coastal roadway and the sea. Uh, now there is a big area 
uh, kind of if you stuck your thumb down into, into Point Loma, into the peninsula, uh, centered on Catalina Avenue, that area is not actually in the coastal zone. So there's a, there's a quite a bit of, of land here that is not subject to the jurisdiction of the coastal uh, coastal commission or the local coastal program. That's the same thing with Roseville. This area over here, much yeah, of this Roseville. area is not in the coastal zone. You would think it is, but that's why we had to get the CPAs for the height limit in these blocks that we did it for uh, for for this Roseville neighborhood. So, all right. Well, I think that's a good discussion. So I I think you know again um, three o'clock. December 2nd, um, if, if Corla, if you can send out notice to everybody on the board and, and people can, people, if they want to attend, let's, let's get people to participate and let's come up with a thoughtful, thoughtful position on behalf of the PCPB on, on, the, on this issue. So thank well, you. We'll okay. notice it like we, well, like we do all of our regular meetings. So it will be posted. Thank you. The thank Monday you. before. All right, and another issue we're working on. So, Mandy, I'm going to turn to you. But um, we've been um, we have on here an update regarding our letter to uh, Mayor Gloria regarding uh, Canistry Pocket Park. Do you want to give us an update on that? Um, yes, um, just very briefly, we did uh, get in contact with the mayor's office, and Coda is currently working for a meeting um, with the mayor's staff the week of December 29th. And so um, if you have any questions regarding the pocket park, um, I would appreciate those questions to be sent to myself and or Don. Um, we were just in the Point Loma RAG meeting earlier and we were notified by park staff that um, $522,000 has been spent um, 794,000 in funding. It includes um, $100,000 that was added um, back in May. And then the total cost of the project is estimated at 1.8 million currently. And um, the Don, uh, when he originally found the money, he found a, a, pot, a bucket of money for 844,000. So again, there's still some um, information that we're needing to verify. But again, we were, there was discussion about the park potentially being um, uh, created into two phases. Um, and they gave us some more specifics. Um, if it were to be built out in two phases, again, there is that potential. The second phase will be much more, it will be more expensive. But the first phase would be $1.3 million. And then the second phase would be um, about $800,000. And so that's where we are currently. Um, we'd like to see city staff, um, you know, we will be billed out of the, the budget, you know, out of, uh, for consultant fees, but um, hopefully after we have the discussion with the mayor staff, see where they're at with um, advocating for the park. And if we are looking to, uh, established a park in a phased out approach. We'd like to bring city staff to the board to present and let the community decide what they would like to see happen at that site. So I do wanna commend Don for his work on the park. Um, he's been working on this for seven years and I am very appreciative that we've gotten in contact with the mayor's office and they seem to be um, opening up the dialogue and conversations. So that's good uh, information. Um, I did want to come back to the CPC. Last month, I did represent the board um, at the CPC meeting. They did discuss the county redistricting process, very similar to what's happening in the city, same reasons. But um, that's going on at this time. There was an informational presentation done by the San Diego County Independent Redistricting Commission, um, as well as the California Citizens Redistricting Commission. And then there was also discussion about the climate resilient San Diego plan. As it was mentioned earlier, the city just released their climate action plan and that is up for uh, recommendations at this time. And so um, a, a resilience plan is part of a climate action plan and really it's a plan to invest in and improve our communities while increasing the local capacity to prepare, adapt and recover and thrive in um, changing climates. And so that's something that um, 
was to be established. It was required based on the state bill 379 that requires all state um, and city and county um, uh, jurisdictions to establish a resiliency plan by January 1st of January 22. And so that's, um, that's why it was rolled out. And then I also presented to the CPC regarding Kate's trees and um, I'll, I'll share my um, presentation with you later, but that was a great opportunity to sound the alarm uh, about the inadequacies of the tree planting um, and maintenance uh, deficiencies within our city and um, to rally around the trees and let people know that they can advocate for trees with the climate action plan. All right, so that's all I have for now. So I guess I can, uh, Corla, do I have the share screen option? I just want to make one clarification. I think, Mandy, you said that you're going to, uh, the week of December 29th, that you're going to talk to the mayor's office, because I think it's the week of November 29th. So oh, week, November week, 29th. You're right. Yes, week, yes, yes. So yes. we're actually, we're making progress. We're going to, we're supposed to talk to them on the week after Thanksgiving. So yes. sooner than that. Thank okay. you for that correction, Fred. All right. Yeah. And so um, I, I would like to go into, um, Corla, do I have the um, ability yes. to share the screen? Yes. Okay. You Let do. me just. Uh, get rid of this, and then I will come back for my presentation. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Items. Thank you. All right. One of the things I've learned is with the park master plan, this, the city has no requirement for trees and public parks or few for other places. And this has gotten me very interested in the status of all things related to trees in the city of San Diego. So this presentation will summarize what's happening, the trends and threats, plans and policies and ways to help and reverse the decline. Healthy historic trees more than 100 years old have been removed from Kensington for reasons that are unclear. This tree and others were planted around 1910 and applications were filed for the city's conservatory heritage tree program, but were not accepted without any good rationale. More than one were healthy when cut down and also hosted at least one active nest of birds. Neighborhood volunteers in Kensington have documented the historic trees and filed a lawsuit to attempt to enforce city policy. This alone is a clear sign that something is not right. And trees are something I fear that too many people take for granted. And when they're gone, they're gone and planting younger trees doesn't replace them. The urban forest refers to both public and private trees. The main difference between public and private trees is that there are no protections to speak of for trees on private properties. They live or die based on the ownership decisions and no mitigations are currently required for tree removals. Public trees in the city are mainly located in parks, streetways, and parkways in the right of way. The public street right of way is generally 10 feet from the curb. And the vast majority of trees citywide are located on private lands, especially on lands with single family homes in front and backyards and side setbacks. For public trees, there are varying degrees of protections and also very few at this time. There are some good policies on the books and politicians do say that they care. Council member Sean Elo Rivera recently proposed mitigation for the private mature trees that are being removed while adding accessory dwelling units on single family lots. San Diego has already begun allowing adding additional units and without any setbacks. Many mature trees are located in existing setbacks and yards that are now being targeted as we densify. The good news is our city has a decent urban forestry program plan. However, it is under supported. Currently, there are only five urban forest staff positions within our city, and it's estimated a need to implement 25 staff positions to adequately address our city's urban forestry needs. 
So yes, more funding is needed, but other structural changes will be required to fulfill the vision for a healthy and growing urban forest. Urban forest staff is currently under the streets division, yet trees are addressed by seven different departments that do not have tree expertise and many have reasons to get trees out of the way. The five-year plan has three main goals each with two objectives and a total of 58 identified actions. The city's cap doesn't, does have a goal of increasing the urban forestry. This shows the most recent year reported in the CAP annual report. The key takeaway is that when trees planted equal trees removed, that means the public forest overall is declining. I heard a landscape architect who worked for the city on urban forestry issues describe the situation in the city as a death spiral for young trees because they're planted and then they die because they're not cared for properly and watered properly. And then they just get replanted again and the shade canopy is never achieved over time. The city's cap is being updated right now and it's going to be released and it is available for a 30 day public comment period. So let's talk about the many benefits of trees. So we don't take them for granted. The large number of benefits of mature trees is indeed long. Street Trees cool our neighborhoods, they make streets more walkable and create a sense of pride and community throughout our city. Trees are infrastructure investments that grow in value over time. Trees absorb carbon dioxide and store carbon and wood, which helps to reduce greenhouse gases. They absorb pollutants. Trees are sound investments for businesses and residents alike and their value increases as they grow. Mature trees actually calm traffic and they make neighbors, neighborhoods safer and quieter. People drive more slowly and carefully through tree-lined streets because trees create an illusion of narrower streets. Faster drivers and slower drivers both drove at decreased speeds in the presence of trees. Trees create jobs that are related to arborists, landscape architects, nursery jobs, park staff, planners and planters and irrigation and other materials. These are just some of the many benefits of trees that they have in our community. And as we know, the benefits of trees are not evenly distributed in the city of San Diego. Recent tree equity measurements show that communities of concern have fewer trees and more urban heat islands. Some of the biggest threats city trees face today are reflected on this slide. A lot of these threats are created due to the wrong tree being planted in the wrong place. However, other significant factors contribute to the decline. It costs quite a bit not to manage trees well and the benefits of trees only add up and rise over time. So it's essential to manage mature trees well. A fully funded and strategically managed urban forestry program is critical to meeting the city's commitment to climate change and adaptation, carbon sequestration, stormwater reduction, wildlife habitat enhancement, and water conservation. Many things can be done to turn around the decline and many of these are included in the city's urban forest plan, but public support is required. And this is just a short list of what we're working on for support within the new climate action plan with regard to trees. Many planting opportunities exist in the city, such as along underplanted arterials in neighborhoods where trees may have been lost or never planted, around schools and in areas around freeway interchanges. When you start to look for a place to plant a tree, you'll see many places, but the key is when, who can provide permission to plant? Is there enough room and access to water and who will maintain it over time? One of the ways you can help address the lack of trees in your community is by taking environmental justice into your own hands. Katestrees.org is a nonprofit project that can help you find the right tree for the right place. Kate's Trees is named in honor of Kate Sessions, who is also known as the mother of Balboa Park. She leased land in what was then called City Park in 1892 for a nursery. And for this privilege, she was given permission to plant 100 trees 
a year in the park and furnish 300 more for planting throughout the city. Kate Session's commitment today is a commitment to help plant 100 trees per year in a community. And it's really a great way to help the environment and to make a positive impact in your community. There's three ways you can participate. You can purchase a tree to plant, or you can make a donation for a tree to be planted in another area or your community, or you can provide a location to plant a donated tree. And right now is a great time to plant a tree. So the city has a decent vision, mission and goals and objectives and long list of actions and policies for the urban forestry. So what's missing that can make a difference? It really sounds corny, but this is it. We need more people to push the system. Tree Watch has identified specific things that people can do to help. Campaigns include restarting the Heritage Tree Program, filling the vacancies on the Community Forest Advisory Board, strengthening the cap, and actually funding and implementing the Urban Forestry Department. So you can all make a difference and it's really simple. All you have to do is just visit treewatchsandiego.org or send an email to treemail at treewatchsd.org. And you can directly support the growing or gifting of the right trees in the right place. And this demonstrates hope for the future. And if you're interested, you can go to katestrees.org to find out how you can purchase or donate a tree in your community. That's all I have tonight. I really want to thank you and just open it up for questions at this time. All right. Well, thank you, Mandy. Obviously, we all we all really appreciate your efforts and more trees, more trees are better. So appreciate you being out there on the front lines of that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And then um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to move on. Um, I just wanted to let the board know that um, in the last month we've received um, there's been discussion in the traffic and transportation. Um, last month, um, outside of Park Point Loma, I, I noticed that they had the leads for a traffic count. And when I inquired about their purpose, I was told that a, a resident had requested the, the street to be evaluated and potentially to have road humps or speed bumps installed. And so uh, previous discussions that had not been um, considered as a mitigation for traffic and transportation because the conversation was that it would have a negative impact on the emergency vehicles. But I have went ahead and um, sent the board and I've asked for Paul Grimes to post the road hump evaluation form as well as the city council policy regarding um, the installation of stop signs, along with the points that get awarded for those types of requests for the board to review at their convenience um, to become more educated on how to make those types of requests. The one thing I will say about road humps is that the city, when yep. making that determination, Join the meeting. Um, when they make that determination, you cannot request it along streets that are designated um, as the emergency route for these vehicles. And so if the request is made, it, there's an extra added step where they look to see if that is a main um, artery that's used by our emergency response vehicles that would eliminate uh, the eligibility for that street if that was the case. Um, so I have all this for everyone. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and with that, let's, uh, did you want me to move on to the action items? Yeah, well, again, I just want to say, I think that that's all good information and it's great to put, I think it's good to put it on the website so that not only board members, but the public can have access to information regarding the stop signs and the road humps and all that. So I think that's all good, good, as, as we say in the, on the agenda, reference material and information for people. So thank you. So. Yeah, I think it's time to, to, to move to our traffic, uh, our traffic um, action item. So and I think the first one is Catalina, Santa Barbara and Hill Street that you have a letter. So why don't you go ahead and present that, Maddie? Sure, all right. Mm. I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen again, pull up the letters. Okay, 
So um, we had um, identified this as an intersection of concern earlier in the year when the Traffic and Transportation Subcommittee basically voted for which, um, which items off of our working traffic and transportation list um, that we would like to have addressed with the city. And so the intersection of Catalina and Santa Barbara at Hill Street and uh, Santa Barbara has been identified um, as an area of concern. And we are asking uh, the intersection of Catalina Boulevard at Santa Barbara Street and Hill Street has been identified as a potentially dangerous intersection due to the K design of the intersection and the topography of the intersection. The Peninsula Community Planning Board requests that the City of San Diego Traffic and Transportation Department conduct a traffic study at Catalina Boulevard at Santa Barbara Street and Hill Street to identify potential traffic mitigations at the intersection. Once potential traffic mitigations have been identified, the PCPB can provide community-based recommendations to the City of San Diego Traffic and Transportation Department. And then um, whichever the outcome of this vote. So um, I'd like to go ahead and open up. Um, I can stop sharing and open it up for discussion at this time. Okay. <clears throat> People have questions or comments? Brad? I'd like to say, oh, excuse me. I can't I can't like raise my hand. I apologize for interrupting. Okay, I, sorry. Thank All you right. for, for requesting a um uh for requesting the review rather than suggesting specific things. I really appreciate that and I can support this completely. Thank you. Okay, Brad, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, well, this has been a problematic intersection forever. Uh, and I'm fully support, you know, once again, asking for something to be done here. Uh, it, I think that Mandy made the observation earlier. It's sort of like, <laughs> how do you fix it? Uh, so uh, um, yeah, I think it's a, a great idea and it's a concise letter. One of the things that I did when I was talking to Gary Pence earlier is that this the traffic department appreciates short letters because when they get really long, they get confused and they don't know who to hand them off to, or they have to copy the letter a few times and send it to different departments. So anyway, short and to the point and uh, certainly has my support. Okay. okay. Do we have a motion or anything? I'll Hands make up. a motion to approve this okay. letter. All right, any, got a second from Don. Bye. All right, any uh, further discussion? All right, it seems sort of non-controversial. So to move it forward, I know that Robert left. So uh, all those in favor, uh, raise your hand and Margaret say. Aye. Aye. Um, Margaret aye. says aye. All right, I think that counts as a, that looks like 11 to, 11 to nothing uh, to approve uh, that letter. I'm here, Joe, I'm here too. First. Okay. Okay, thank you, Joe. So Robert left. Um, did you take note of when he left? Um, all right, left. Me. He left during uh, uh, during the the. Um, he he left at seven fifty. The forcing presentation. Oh, he had to go yeah, he left at seven fifty, Mandy. It's in the chat. Oh, thank you so much mm -hmm. for that. May, okay. may I just may I just say a real quick comment though, because I attended that traffic and transportation committee, and it was really important that in these subcommittees we can only. Mm -hmm suggest to the board what we think of course gathering neighborhood input concerns emails questions because we're gathering all this information from social media from emails from all over the community you know we're not just coming up with these suggestions uh, as a committee it's coming to us from different outlets and it was really important at this last meeting we discussed this I think Matt brought up a good point that when we approach the board, we really are looking for your input. You know, we're drafting as much as we can and suggesting as much as we can, but we really need the rest of the board members that can't make it to these meetings to help us really like word it correctly. If we miss something, 
and really leave it up to you guys to tailor and tweak the letters that we kind of just basically draft up. So I appreciated your, your feedback, um, Corla, and your kudos because it really is a group effort and bringing it to the board is tough because you're just basing it off a subcommittee suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that one, I think that one's good. I, I, I drive through that intersection all the time. So people are, people are always confused as to what they're doing there. So, but I don't know, I don't know how to solve it. So I think a, a letter asking for clarification or an investigation by the city is, is a good idea. So right. Mandy, how okay. about you want to do the second, uh, second one regarding yes. the Floyd, uh, corridor? Uh, yes, this is a letter requesting, um, the traffic safety evaluation on the Froud corridor from Voltaire to Sunset Cliffs Boulevard and to evaluate alternative um, traffic safety mitigations available to calm the traffic along Froud. And so um, I did receive, um, let me share my screen and share the letter and um, I'll just give some high level background. Um, on this one moment. Oh, wrong letter. Hold on one second. All right, here it is. Okay, so this is a letter requesting. Um, this is a, a follow up letter. We originally, back in April of this, uh, sorry, of February of this year, had approved a letter um, requesting that the council member override the city council policy for the stop sign installation. And we requested a four way. Mandy, I think that this is, I think you're the, you don't have the right letter up. You have the letter regarding the palm tree, though. Yeah, can we do that um, while it's up? Can, can you? Yeah, it's the palm tree letter. Can we go ahead and do that while it's up? We can skip. Uh, if, no. if we have it up, you guys want to do that? We can skip to number four because we have it. Um, I don't have that up. I'm looking at something different. Um, I have it. The one I've seen is re FAA removal of palm, palm trees along 44. Oh, let me. Un well, apologies. Well, it allow them to be able to to uh, <laughs> leave. Early. Let me share the screen again. Apologies <laughs> for that. Um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Okay. <laughs> Can you see the fraud letter now? I believe that that is the fraud letter. Traffic okay. mitigation measures of fraud corridor. All right, thank okay. you. Apologies for the confusion. Okay, so back in February, we had originally sent a letter to our council member requesting that she override um, the council policy and to install um, a four-way stop sign at Cape May and Froud. At that time, we had been um, approached by the neighbor, um, Dan Finn, He's been organizing the neighbors um, with regard to this stretch of road. Um, originally, the request was to um, review the corridor from Voltaire to Newport, but um, we've created another letter because um, there was no um, movement on behalf of our council member and the neighbors were still experiencing some issues and the city had come back stating that they were not going to, that there was no movement to override that policy. And so in the traffic and transportation, Dan appeared and the thought was that we provide, um, we ask that um, due to the lack of stop signs and vehicle speed, several near misses between pedestrians and vehicles observed by community members living along the Froud Street corridor. The Peninsula Community Planning Board is requesting that the City of San Diego Traffic and Transportation Department uh, fund a traffic feasibility study along the Froud Street corridor to determine potential appropriate traffic mitigations that addresses local community members' concerns. And then based on the results of the traffic feasibility study, the Peninsula Community Board would advocate for the installation of a four-way stop sign at Froud and Cape May and traffic calming measures such as the installation of diverters, advisory bike lanes, and curb ball bouts at the intersections. And so the neighbors are experiencing, we have 15 um, attached to the letter is 15, um, 
uh, affidavits basically of neighbors along Froud that are experiencing um, unsafe, dangerous a lot of this traffic happens around sunset when people are going to visit um, sunset cliffs. And um, with the original request, um, you know, we asked for the study and we extended it from the original request of Voltaire and Newport to get a holistic view of what's happening along that entire corridor because they are coming from that area of our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we've expanded the area for um, review. And then the request for the recommendations that we made, um, you know, we just looked through the toolkit of what are some known traffic calming uh, measures that we could potentially request. Um, the installation of diverters was an option. The advisory bike lanes, which would not remove any parking, um, that would potentially narrow the street. Proud is quite wide. Um, it's a lot wider than the other streets in the area. I believe we had a determination that it was 36 feet wide um, up to, um, I believe it was Long Branch, or, uh, and then it goes to 40 feet. Um, I may have to correct you on which intersection it, it gets wider. But the other option was um, to do like curb ball bouts at the intersections. And the purpose of that would to have the ball bout and it would promote the visibility of the pedestrians in the area. And so I did receive, um, I did receive some uh, feedback from Paul Grimes regarding um, fraud, you know, um, he, uh, this was passed through committee for, with uh, unanimous. There was um, full support of this, but he mentioned that he think the, the concentration of um, the study should be from the Voltaire to Newport section per this email he sent to me. And um, there was concern again about the city policy um, with regards to installing um, stop signs because again along the stretch from Newport uh, from Voltaire to Newport it's a 0.44 mile stretch of no stop signs and so the neighbors um, have been going before our board Dan Finn has come now to like nine meetings between our meetings and those at um, the OB planning board and um, they're looking to find relief and so I'd like to open it up. Oh, and actually, you know, I take that back. I did receive another um, concern about Froud and Kate May. And this came from Jeff Page. And I will go ahead and read that out loud as well. Uh, PCPB, I am writing to oppose the letter from the PCPB's transportation subcommittee. The city of San Diego already examined the idea of a four-way stop and determined one was not warranted for Froud and Kate May. Board member Havlick acknowledged this at the October meeting, but stated a desire to go over the city's traffic engineers and ask council member Campbell to overrule the city's engineers. This is not a proper action for the PCPB. The letter contains a number of letters uh, with antidotal information about how dangerous fraud is. I have personally traveled fraud thousands of times in 34 years of driving from my home to downtown Ocean Beach at all hours of the day and night. I have never witnessed a single accident. Um, anecdotal accounts are not enough to request such major changes. The PCPB's transportation subcommittee at the very least should have obtained the accident records for fraud to substantiate the needs for this request. That information is clearly lacking. This letter is in fact a thinly disguised cycling proposal where it talks about advisory bike lanes and curb ball bouts. I encourage the PCPB to table this letter until the subcommittee produces real information about the accident history on fraud. So um, let's go ahead and open it up for discussion. All right, if we can get out of the screen share. And I first first hand I saw was Paul Grimes. So Paul, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, and uh, thank you, Mandy, for mentioning what I uh, had sent in earlier. Uh, I did vote for the uh, as a community member at the uh, last meeting for this, and then I did take a, a little bit more of a look into what what was being proposed as a possibility. Uh, as far as bike lanes, I I really believe at this point that we should not involve bikes into this situation here. 
the situation is speed on a seven uh, block section that's not, uh, that has no stop signs uh, or any stoppage at all. Uh, the rest of, uh, there's a middle section of fraud that would also be included in the letter, which basically does not have an issue, has multiple stop signs. And then the small section down below, I believe it's a Point Loma Avenue. Uh, the, there are parallel streets on either side where, where cars can be uh, going. The problem with this uh, section is that there are stop signs on the parallel streets on both sides and it's being used as a bypass. And that, uh, that the, the fact that the city is looking at uh, whether this applies or not uh, is, is based on criteria and they're not looking at the whole picture. The whole picture would indicate that the cars are speeding through there and cutting through a neighborhood street that does not have a double yellow line. And it, uh, it, it seven blocks is just crazy considering that. We have other streets in the area like this over on uh, uh, Locust uh, in that area. And we have similar situations with the same complaints at some times. As far as the uh, bike lane situation, the advisory lanes are kind of, uh, uh, I looked at that and they would not be appropriate. They're not really used for this type of purpose. They're intended for very low volume streets, maybe through parks or something and no, uh, no parking. Uh, they would be having the middle lane, if you took the 30 foot section, six foot section, took the two parking out and the two five foot bike lanes, you'd only have like eight feet left for, for cars going both directions. Now they would be having to move over but this is kind of the exact opposite of the way sharrows are done. It's kind of considered an anti-sharrow kind of situation where the sharrows everybody shares under this, can, under this, the bikes have these lanes with the dash lines next to them. The cars have to divert into the lanes. So it's, I think, very confusing. And I don't think we want to bring that into uh, San Diego at this time. Um, I, I do see that if you read the uh, information on, on uh, putting uh, stop signs in, that uh, in part 2C of that, it, it's appropriate for uh, community groups to hold an, a hearing and then uh, try to uh, push that forward if they believe signs are necessary. And uh, I think that's probably the way we should potentially look at to move forward. Thank you. Thank All you. right, I see uh, Paul uh, Jamison, do you, do you have a comment? I do, yeah, I'm Paul Jamison, volunteer board member for Bike San Diego. Uh, who was the author of that letter again? Oh, Mandy? I was. Okay, um, so let's see, the anecdotal data. So uh, you were critical of the anecdotal data then that we need actual data, but then you provided your own anecdotal data that you've written, that you've gone down this many times and never seen any problems. I don't understand no, why no. once that. That was Jeff Page's letter. Oh That's yeah, no, I was yeah. reading oh, the letter out yeah. loud. I read, read this before and it was on OB RAG, yes. Okay, so. I don't understand why Jeff's set of anecdotal data is superior to the anecdotal data that he's criticizing of the residents who live there and give us all the time. Um, anyway, the, the issue about not involving bikes or that advisory lanes would not be appropriate. Um, Paul Grimes, are, do you have some sort of authority where you determine where advisory lanes are and are not appropriate? I mean, sheriffs are, are terrible. They've been proven to be more dangerous than having no bike lanes at all. So. Um, I'd really like to see some advisory lanes here. And then the final issue would be about traffic engineers and overruling them. I mean, traffic engineers have created these incredibly dangerous streets for pedestrians and bicyclists in the city. So I think the more we can overrule them by going through our elected representatives, I would fully support that. So thanks. And, and just to clarify that point, Paul, um, you know, the, there, there is that option, and Gary Pence did advise us that if we are interested in overriding the city council policy, that that would come in the form of a letter request to the council member to see if that would be something she would be interested in. Um, and as it, earlier in the meeting, um, that has not been, uh, re, she has not yet responded with what she intends to do. And so that's why we wanted to bring another letter in um, to help provide relief for the community. All right, um, Mandy, I'll just, let me just make a general comment that sure. people on the committee can address too. I mean, it seems to me a little bit internally inconsistent that we're asking for a, another traffic mitigation study. And then we're actually, then based upon the results of the traffic feasibility study, then we're making recommendations. So, so I guess my question is, 
how can we make recommendations based upon a traffic feasibility study that we haven't received yet? Yeah. And again, these weren't like actual, you know, they're saying that they don't want to put the stop signs. Um, we've received information between my board and um, Tracy. Uh, she's the chair of the traffic and transportation of Ocean Beach. Um, there's been a few other requests along that corridor at Saratoga as well. Um, and Froud, where the city has denied the request for stop signs as well. And, and you know, again, um, we did survey the community members, you know, Dan um, has been uh, an advocate for his community. Um, that is very close to Ocean Beach Elementary. It is a walking community. And um, we were just looking to see if the city um, did complete that feasibility study. These are just some of the recommendations we thought that could help potentially calm the traffic in that area. Okay, Matt, I've seen- you had a question? Yeah, generally, go ahead, Matt. I didn't. Matt had hands been up, so I want to let everybody talk. Oh yeah, I, I I think Mandy ended up touching on some of what I was going to say, but also in response to what you were putting out there, Fred. Like in in this situation, it was more of a you know, what are some different ideas that we could kind of throw out there that, um, you know, if the city's not receptive to this idea of a stop sign and that's what the residents mm -hmm. are requesting, what other ideas might be feasible? to investigate for how to calm traffic in this corridor. So trying to, you know, use that as a suggestion more than like, you know, direct them to do such things, if that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just wondering if the letter should say, if we were gonna do, if we were gonna keep stuff like that in there that we would say, based upon the results of the traffic feasibility study, the Peninsula Community Planning Board would, would want the city to consider traffic mitigation things such as the installation of the four-way stop, da, da, da. Is yeah, I can change, is, I can change the wording of that. Yeah, if you want to be more like, if if, if they deem yeah. it appropriate, that these are the recommendations that we would like to see. Yeah, it just seems awkward that we're advocating for specific solutions when we haven't had the study yet. But uh, Brad, Brad knows a lot about traffic issues and I see your hand up, so Brad, go ahead. <clears throat> I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I think this is a, you know, when I first read the letter, it was like, oh, okay. I wasn't really familiar with what was going on in that because I, I ride around that hill fairly frequently, but not along Froud so much. But what I found compelling and, you know, Margaret had made the comment about asking for input um, was all the supporting letters from the people that live on the street. I mean, and almost it seems as though the, this letter should start with basically here a bunch of letters from the, uh, the residents of Froud who really want something done here and we want to support these letters. Um, and in, in addition to that, so it just seems like that first paragraph would almost just be slightly modified to emphasize the, the people and all their letters and their stating about these stop signs and vehicle speeds and all the people coming from Sunset Cliffs that have found the shortcut to get out of Point Loma uh, because it was, uh, I don't know, it, it would, did a lot to change my mind there. Um, uh, Fred's point's taken and Corla's mentioned it in the past about you know, these measures that are, but you did say advocate, you didn't say put them in, um, but Fred's point's well taken about, you know, we wouldn't, we would not be opposed to this. But <clears throat> finally, in my conversations with Gary Pence, doing what you're asking here is totally proper and appropriate. This is the appeals process to the failure to be able to get the stop sign. Sure, it didn't meet the stop sign um, criteria to have a stop put at Cape May and Froud. So ask for it. And you just got to mm -hmm. get city council on board to make it happen. Um, oh. I, Paul had mentioned the same thing. It's just that, and, and Gary was open to that. You know, yeah, these traffic engineers, they have made some bad decisions because none of them ride bikes ever. Uh, so well, that's not right, but you know, yes, I'm certain that some of you would probably agree, but um, doesn't seem like it sometimes. But uh, so I think this is 
uh, the intent of this is really good and that the supporting levers, letters just are very compelling, I thought. So thank you very much. I, yeah, I, I guess I'm going to, Brad, I, if I, let me see if I understand, but I, I think to a certain extent you're right, because we have the thing, we, we wrote a letter in February, and then apparently we have a February 1st letter that we sent in asking them to study it, and then they just did, denied the stop sign. So right. it seems like it should say something that, you know, that, that this is an appeal by the, by the planning board that, you know, we sent our letter in February, the stop sign was denied, but we have received significant input from the community that a stop sign would be appropriate. We've attached that and we'd like the city to reconsider and this is what we'd like them to do, something along those, those lines. You know, I felt like um, providing the, co the public comment and the original letter and the enclosure of the letter. Um, I know I didn't go through all of that um, online, but I did include the original letter as well as all of the testimony um, as an enclosure to the letter. And I felt that was sufficient, but um, I can definitely add additional verbiage to um, to request that they ex you know accelerate the response to this request due to the amount of concern from the community uh, members. Well, it's on their radar. So I think that, you know, you just need city council to step up and say, hey, the community wants this, even though it didn't meet your criteria. Mm -hmm. And I think the point's well taken. There's all those other streets, the hell have stop signs, you know, and these people leaving the cliffs, they're looking for that shortcut. And I mean, we all do, right? The back road routes. And this is one. And um, a lot of those people are going too fast. And in those letters, it's uh, unnerving and um, it makes them anxious. All right, uh, Paul Grimes, I know you had your hand up for a long time, so I, I don't know if I still have a comment to make or not. Well, I just want to respond a little bit on the, the, the bike uh, coalition gentleman. I mean, I am not a uh, traffic engineer, but I can surely read and I can calculate things like on a 36 foot street that putting these advisory lanes in would, re would have 10 feet in the middle of the road that these cars are supposed to go down and then go around another car when it comes the other direction. I think there's enough traffic on the street. And if, if these advisory lanes we put in, I wouldn't be surprised if the bike uh, coalition would want the stop signs not put in to make it a bike boulevard. And uh, that would make it even worse as far as volumes. Uh, I think volume is a problem and speed is a problem. And that uh, by, by putting a stop sign in would help but by adding bicycles on the street and by markings would maybe make the situation even worse. I assume the bike people can go on other on other routes. Okay. All right, Don, I saw your hand. Did you have a comment? Yeah, in the interest of time, I would uh, make a motion to approve sending the letter with the changes. Uh, the letter is going over your signature. With the letter going out and the changes you've made um, and without asking for a bike lanes at this time. I'll and second to, that. And to remove the advisory bike lane, Don? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that can be added later. Yeah, okay. Is there any more discussion? I saw Paul Webb. Yeah, I, I wanted to point out, I live on Gizzo Street, parallel to Froud. We have multiple stop signs between Newport and Voltaire. They do not slow traffic. People speed down our street all hours of the day and night. Uh, we don't even have the dips that, uh, that Froud has, which can slow cars. At least they slow my car because it's very low and, and bottoms out when I go, go over the dips. Uh, stop signs are not a speed control device. He's, he's right. And shouldn't be considered as such. Well, I appreciate your, com your comments. Thank you. Any other comments? Oh, Angela? I have one. May I ask what would be suggested to alleviate the speed? Enforcement. Okay. <laughs> <Good Good luck. laughs> that's, that's unfortunately the reality and um, just enforcement of that because a lot of times we do see with these issues, it's just they find another street or they find another corridor to, to get out in and out of but again, this is an extreme circumstance and um, I'd like to um, 
if there's not any other discussion, we can go ahead with the. I think I, we have we have uh, Sam has his hand oh, up. Sam. Oh, Nicole sorry. Has her hand up. So we have at least two com more comments. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one of, one of the issues I wanted to make is that the concept I think in the first paragraph should be for reconsideration because of the input we've had from the community that things are not working on the street and we don't want to uh, have this continue. So from that standpoint, I think the concept of reconsideration, since they already didn't act on our initial approach is very important. Right. Thank you, Sam. Yes, I can, um, again, change the wording to um, ask the city to, you know, accelerate or expedite the request uh, and, and make uh, it more urgent, being that this is the a second letter that's, you know, being sent. Thank you. Thank and you. then Nicole. Nicole. I, you know, I just wanted to comment on some of what Paul, both Pauls are saying, right? So one is saying, you know, advisory lanes was just an option. So it was just a suggestion to kind of throw out there because it's kind of what Matt just put in the chat. It's really about road design. The stop signs do not really, we talked about it in the, in the, in the subcommittee. And so advisory lanes are not necessarily, we don't actually, nobody in the city actually knows how they work because we don't have any in the city. So it's an innovative treatment that the city is actually exploring. They put some on Hancock actually to maintain the uh, diagonal parking and to provide the safe facility for people on bikes. Um, I, I personally ride all the streets in, in OB. And so, um, you know, we're not in more danger because you provide a safe facility for us and lane markings for us. We are actually safer. And so it, it, it just gives that, um, it just, it, it just it designs the street differently. If you look at like some major cities, they're really just painting the town. They're even doing like painted crosswalks and painted intersection. It's really to try to make a, a pedestrian and biker kind of a, a corridor rather than just speeding down it and just having this blacktop that you're just like, woohoo, race through it. So, um, it's just a suggestion in there, and it's just, you know, it, it was just something to explore. Um, and so I'll at that. But yeah, I, I appreciate the work you guys have done and the input that's been made. Right. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor. I know Don um, had made that first, and then Angela had seconded that motion. So um, let's all go, all those in favor. Well, I think we're going to, I'm going to do a roll call just to make sure. Right, you do it. Okay. Can we clarify the motion again? Is is it taking out that bike yeah. thing? And yeah, it would remove the advisory bike lane. And then um, just changing the, the verbiage to just um, ask the city to um, make, you know, make the request more urgent. So does the, mo the person making the motion want to reconsider that taking out the advisory lanes? Because it is just a suggestion. We're not recommending any of that, you know, just something. That was. Oh, Don. Who oh. made the Don? You made the mo the motion. Yeah. Are you willing to consider the removal of the advisory uh, bike lanes and keep that in the letter? I no. I suggested taking it out. Uh, ball bouts would might help, and the bike lanes could be added later. But I think more complicated with the bike lanes at this time. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So we've got a motion. Uh, to accept the letter, um, increase the verbiage for urgency for the response from the city in the first paragraph, and then to remove the advisory bike lanes from our request as possible um, mitigations for that area. And so, Don, you first. Um, Angela seconded that. Are you still? You're still I'm, seconding. I'm in favor. Here? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, let me. I'm going to call the roll then. All right. Go All ahead. Right. All right, Margaret. Yes. With the Brett. changes. With the change, with it, this is this is this is a motion, the motion to approve the letter with the changes as discussed in the meeting. So that's a yes. Aye. From Brad, yes. Corla, aye. Mandy, yes. Don, yes. Angela, yes. Nicole, yes. Matt, yes. Joe? Yes. Sam? Yes. 
Paul. Yes. Okay. That's unanimous. That is. Yeah, I could have. I could have just had a raise of hands, but eleven zip. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm very grateful for the support of this, and I know that the neighbors will be very help. Will be very relieved as well. You know, I, I say this, he wasn't, he wasn't able to make it. He is an EMT for the, he works for the city of Encinitas fire department, just to give you a little background um, on him. And I had to, I have to commend him. You don't need state farm. You need a neighbor like Dan Finn to show up for you. And so um, I commend him for, for advocating for his, his uh, neighborhood. All right. So that was action item number two. Let's go to action item. Did we ever vote? Three. I'm sorry. Did we three. vote on one? The first uh, vote yes. on one, yes. Yeah. One was one was a unanimous eleven to nothing to ask for the uh, <laughs> traffic study for the uh, for Santa Barbara, Catalina, and Catalina, Santa Barbara, Hill. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just lots of discussion. Okay. So now, um, action item number three. This is a letter requesting the review of the Nimitz corridor and installation of bike lanes, and um, requesting the city to complete um, West Point Loma Boulevard bike lanes. Um, that was a project that had been approved by the board um, back in um, several years ago um, when I first came on the board. Okay, and so um, let me go ahead and share my screen and then we will and we'll get that letter for you. I wanna thank Matt. Matt um, did uh, create this letter for us and uh, there is, One moment. One moment. Oh, stop share. Hold on one second. I'm having issues here. Okay, can everyone see my screen? I can see it. And then it says review Nimitz corridor and request completion of previous. It does, years. it does, right. you got the right letter. All right, perfect. All right. Um, the, I don't know, I don't know if you need to read the whole letter. Yeah, that one's a longer one. Give like people a summary of what we're asking for, I think. Yeah, and basically um, there's been recent collisions, um, you know, along the Nimitz corridor. And in the letter, it was referenced, you know, the fatality of a skateboarder. And there was a cyclist that had received injuries um, in the form of a, a broken leg. And, and Matt had provided links for that um, as well. And so we were asking um, for them to review the corridor and to make some specific, some of the requests were to complete the Western segment of the West Point Loma Boulevard cycle track. Um, and then the other issue was to install class four bike lanes along Nimitz Boulevard, south of West Point Loma Boulevard, um, as this will coincide with some slurry seal that's scheduled for the coming year. And then, um, and then um, along the I-8 and Nimitz uh, corridor, when you get off of the eight, and make that left into our community. There's a fork that's there that basically um, the, the left two lanes will go into Point Loma and then the right lanes will go into the ocean beach um, into suns you know, onto sunset cliffs. Well, the line there, um, when you make that left turn, if you're in that right, that far right lane making a left, the lane, uh, there's no delineation of the line. And so they would like to add that there's some lane markings there to help um, educate the commuters as to where their lane is going and to help reduce the confusion in that area. And so um, I'd like to just open, um, I'd like to read a letter that we did receive regarding um, the letter. And so, um, this is from Jeff Page. It reads, the first sentence in the PCPB's proposed letter states, recent collisions between motorists and active transportation users at the intersection of Nimitz and West Point Loma Boulevard, including the recent fatality of a skateboarder and cyclist, 
uh, with a broken leg underscored the needs for safety improvements in this corridor. Um, he says, I, uh, I, he vehemently, I'm sorry, he vehemently opposes the PCPB mischaracterizing information in an effort to forward its transportation recommendations. The skateboarding fatality at Nimitz and West Point Loma Avenue Boulevard um, was the complete fault of the skateboarder. The rider shot out into Nimitz against a red light and was hit by a car. This had nothing to do with any lack of safety improvements. The cyclist injury information was not attached to the letter as stated. Um, and we remedied that there was an issue with the links for the letter. Um, the misinformation does not end there. Item number one states, complete the Western segment of the West Point Loma Boulevard uh, cycle trap. Over a year of design and community feedback went into this plan, which was scheduled for installation in 2019. The part that is not true is the community feedback statement. One only had to witness the storm of anger that came up after the cycling improvements were made on West Point Loma to see that never happened. Item number two states, this would include a segment where a cyclist was left lying in the road with a broken pelvis. Um, and then we, we did provide further information. Um, and he was asking, when did this occur? Who is at fault? This is deliberately inflammatory with no facts. Um, and then he says, the idea of bike lanes on Nimitz is a dangerous folly. The speed limit is 45 miles per hour and traffic exceeds that limit regularly. There are plenty of alternate routes advocating for bike lanes on a road like this is irresponsible and not something the PCPB should consider. The first person injured on this road after these improvements will certainly include the PCPB in their lawsuit against the city if the PCPB votes for these improvements. This is another cycling advocacy letter. At the very least, if the PCPB wants to make such a recommendation, then the PCPB should hold a public forum to discuss these ideas, not offer, oh, not fire off a letter created by a few cycling advocates on the pretense that it represents the peninsula community as a whole. And so I'm gonna stop sharing the screen at this time. And then, um, and um, I'd like to open up the conversation for discussion. Um, All right, I got, I think I saw Paul Jamison. I thought, I think I see, saw you first, Paul. Yeah, hey, I'm really encouraged by the support for Safer Streets on those earlier agenda items. I think, you know, a lot of folks here are on the same page where we maybe just don't agree on the way to achieve it. So it's really encouraging the earlier items. And I think that ties into this too. Um, you know, even at the state level, we've gotten rid of that speed trap law, right? So we can actually reduce our speed limits on some of these streets now uh, where we base them on the 85th percentile. So a street like Nimitz, hey, what about maybe a speed reduction to reduce traffic speed? But um, I wanna talk about when I biked to the ATP tennis tournament that was at the Barnes Tennis Center. Um, the segment where there was that protected bike lane was up great. It was amazing. And I'm so grateful it was there. I couldn't disagree more with Jeff's uh, assessment of that. But then it abruptly ends and it kind of just dumped me out into high speed traffic. It was super dangerous. And, you know, several other people had ridden to this event too. So the more people who could bike there is less traffic, right? Um, but I hear this criticism that we shouldn't even be riding on these high speed roads in the first place, but how else would I have gotten there? There, there is no alternative route to get to this facility. So, and while I was at Barnes, I learned at the kids tennis center. So we're sending kids to this tennis center on this super dangerous high speed road. I don't understand, I just don't get the priorities. Why is it more important to move traffic quickly or and have abundant free street parking than our kids lives? So, but maybe I just am not getting something. Anyway, these are all public roads that we all pay for. We have bicyclists and pedestrians have a right to access them safely. So I'd really like to see the bike lane completed there. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. And then I, uh, thank you, Paul. Yeah, I, I see another public comment from William Radigan. Have I got that right, hopefully? Yeah, you got that right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Will Radigan. I'm uh, the advocacy manager for the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition. Um, 
And yeah, agreeing with Paul, it's really great to see all this focus on road safety here. It seems like everyone's on the same page um, that we want to make Point Loma a safer place for all road users. Um, I definitely do want to contest a few of the assertions made in that uh, in the response to this letter. Um, one being that there are alternate routes uh, around Nimitz Boulevard and that uh, it's irresponsible for cyclists to ride down Nimitz. Um, coming from the Point Loma area and uh, heading up north towards La Jolla, towards um, Pacific Beach and Ocean Beach, um, there, actually, there isn't really an alternate route. And uh, cyclists, of course, have as much of a right to use those roads to get where they want to go as anywhere else. Um, and so it is necessary to have some kind of infrastructure there. However, uh, it is true that you know, simply painting a striped bike lane on the road, uh, especially when that road has a speed limit of 45 miles per hour, is incredibly unsafe, unsafe which is why the letter uh, calls for a class four uh, separated bikeway, which has some kind of separation between um, car and bicycle traffic. Um, at 45 miles per hour, uh, having cyclists and car traffic share a lane of any kind, even if it is a striped bike lane, is extremely unsafe. Um, we know that at 25 miles per hour, uh, a cyclist's chance of serious injury or death when being struck by a car is around 10%. But uh, by 40 miles per hour, that jumps up to 75%. So um, cyclists will be riding this road. And if they're doing that and they don't have protective facility, it's not a question of when someone will be seriously injured or killed. Uh, sorry, not a question of if, it is a question of when. Um, so for people that are concerned about losing parking or traffic congestion, I just really urge you to think about the human consequences of um, not having any kind of cyclist infrastructure on this road, which is that people will eventually um, be seriously injured or killed. And unfortunately, that's a fact. It may sound like an exaggeration, but um, as we've seen on Pershing Drive this summer, where after years of delay, uh, two cyclists were killed, um, when there isn't safe infrastructure, people do die. Um, so just want to encourage you all to think about that uh, and make sure we set the right priorities with this uh, proposal. Um, thanks a lot for everyone who supported this letter. All right, thank you, Will. Uh, sticking with public comment, DK, I see you have a comment. Uh, yeah, thanks for giving me a chance to speak. I just wanted to sort of uh, zoom out and, and thank Mandy and the Transportation Traffic Board for putting this letter together, uh, generated from this group. I think it's quite good. And, and to Paul's uh, comment earlier, I, I do think that we can all look each other in the eye and say, hey, you know, we're in favor of safety on roads. I think part of what I find um, I guess somewhat ironic about this entire process is this letter that was sent by this person. I mean, frankly, I don't wanna go sort of out of my lane, but I don't understand why we're reading out those types of comments that are not contributing anything to the conversation that we're having here. I think we're just giving a platform to nonsense and, and to, I mean, I guess it's an individual who's part of the community, but, but I don't see what's productive of, of putting out those thoughts and those questions. So I just wanna say thank you to Mandy and the work that you're doing. I think it's wonderful and I'd like to see this letter be supported. Okay, thank you, DK. Elizabeth, uh, do you have a comment you'd like to make? You're, you're muted, Elizabeth. I haven't fully read the letter, but I travel all the roads that we've been discussing tonight and I think the most dangerous part of that Nimitz West Point Loma Boulevard is the turn when you're coming when when you're coming south on Nimitz and turning west on West Point Loma. And at some previous meeting, we had a discussion because that it used to be that it was uh, basically legal to to pull into the right if you were in a car. Um, where the bike lane is, and then they extended the bike lane, but the cars pay no attention to that. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely dangerous to both the pedestrian, both the bicyclists and the cars, because if you follow the rules, the cars in a car, the cars will pull to the right of you, and then it's very difficult to make that right turn. So at some earlier meeting of this group, I believe there was a discussion about um, the possibility of doing something with the park boundary so that the bicycles were actually riding in the park rather than in the place that they are now. What happened to that? That is um, great. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. There is a right turn lane that has been approved by the Ocean Beach Planning Board. 
Um, that is a shared intersection. And I know that that has been um, approved by the board. Tracy, would you like to speak on that, um, that recommendation at all? I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to do a number of different things at the same time. So oh, sorry about really, that, Tracy. Yeah, no, I wasn't uh, really like, I wasn't when was like the right really involving? What was the question? When was like, the right turn lane um, at Nimitz and West Point Loma Boulevard approved by the Ocean Beach Planning Board? Oh, Is we that... actually requested that last year sometime. Okay. Um, yeah, it was a while ago. Okay. I mean, the, the one to go from West Point Loma or from Nimitz to West Point Loma? Yes. Yeah, we, we asked for that a long time ago. Nicole might actually remember this too. We actually asked for a, 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 a dedicated bike turn lane on that, on that corner. And there was a conversation, um, Nicole had mentioned that uh, the parks, people were planning on doing something there, but they hadn't gotten around to it. Cause we were, we were all like, ah, there's plenty of room there. They could totally make a dedicated right turn lane. And, um, Nicole said that they were waiting to do something. And I don't, I don't really remember from there. Maybe Nicole can fill in on that. <laughs> it was so long ago. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to turn to board comment now. And so Paul, Paul Webb's been patient for the longest. So I'm going to go, Paul's going to go first and then I'll go to Brad and to, and to Don. Yeah. A, a comment and then a question. Sure. That was my route to ride to work when I rode my bike to the airport every, uh, multiple times a week. Uh, I never really... Question. Proposing and suggesting. Would they result in any elimination of traffic lanes for automobiles? You know, Paula, you, you were kind of breaking up, so I don't know if you could repeat it a little bit. I didn't yeah. I don't know if everybody heard it. I, I just got a message that my internet connection is unstable, so I'm not sure if you can hear me. Are the improvements that you are proposing for, for Nimitz, would they result in the uh, reduction in the number of through traffic lanes for automobiles? No, I don't see that in our request. I don't see it in your request. I'm talking about building the kind of improvements you're suggesting. At, at least for the at least for the more more uh, northern segment of this, where there's already the painted uh, buffered bike lanes, uh, there should be plenty of room for the city to work with, um, or two through traffic lanes in each direction. Because I note that at, at Nimitz and Rosecrans, to put in the new bike lane there, they eliminated a traffic lane. And my point is. I, I believe that if you're proposing something that's going to eliminate traffic lanes, this is very controversial in our community. The letter should identify that and acknowledge that, as should the agenda heading, so that people in the community know what we're talking about. I don't, Matt, I don't see any reduction in this request. If they were to go to a class four, would there be any reduction of the lanes? that are existing. I don't believe that would just change it to a protected class, correct? Is that where they would bring in the ballards or the, the flex post to, to enforce the security of the bike lane, Matt? That's, that's my understanding. Yes, yeah. I don't see that there's any lane reduction being requested in this, Paul. The well, I don't see it requested, but I note, note that what they did uh, immediately north of Rosecrans or northwest of Rosecrans on Nimitz, uh, they did eliminate a through lane in order to accommodate the expanded bike lane. And uh, are, is, is this, would it extend all the way down Nimitz uh, the, the way it is at, at the uh, Rosecrans intersection? I, I don't know the answer to that. And I think that you know, the, the public would like to know that. And maybe we, we agree that that's a good thing. Uh, I just think it should be discussed. All right, Brad, did you have a comment? Uh, I've got several. Um, Paul, are you talking about uh, Nimitz at Evergreen and Lowell going south? No, I'm talking, well, yes, but I was actually talking about Nimitz and Rosecrans where the two left-hand turn lanes immediately uh, reduced to one lane until you make the, the turn at Evergreen and then it opens to two lanes again. My question is, would the, what's being proposed result in 
the elimination of that, that right lane. Right. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, I would think not. I, I, how, about, how about this? <clears throat> In my conversation with Gary Pence and uh, regarding this roundabout situation there at Nimitz, and some of you are gonna be pleased to hear this, that um, the Nimitz bike group has a draft bike facility for all of Nimitz that they're reviewing. It's actually seems to be coming to fruition. So uh, uh, certainly this would be uh, helpful to reiterate this. And, and let me just back up really quickly. I don't completely disagree with Jeff Page. Both that bike situation and that unfortunate skateboarder Six o'clock in the morning, cutting across traffic on a left turn, uh, reckless maybe. And the other one was at 11 o'clock at night. So I don't know, I mean, accidents happen. I mean, it's a little bit like the skateboarder up there on Voltaire, you know, yeah. uh, who, kn who knows. Uh, but, um, but that said, this needs to be addressed. And uh, there is a facility that's coming um, something else that we discussed is that 50% of occasional bike riders won't even ride or are uncomfortable with any kind of bike lane other than a class one. So if we're trying to get, I mean, we're talking class four, yes, that's good, it's protected, but you know, at some point we're gonna have to start thinking that we're gonna have to be going to class one, two-way class one bike lanes and separate it from cars and just allow bikes to be able to move around by themselves. I realized lots of money, lots of changes in mindset. It's not gonna happen here, but um, I'm, I think that this should be done. Um, item number two on this, the, or is it three, three? Um, item number three, uh, that's a Caltrans issue is what Gary said. You got the, and it's, it says terminal of I-8, but it's terminus. Uh, the city doesn't have a whole lot to do with the, where I-8 ends and then the supporting traffic is that that's got Caltrans oversight. So uh, we need, I, I don't know how you get that group involved in this process because I think they have oversight to it. At least that was Gary's perception. So he was sort of like, uh, I don't know what to do from West Point Loma North up to the bridge. So um, let's see the Western stall class ones. Uh, so the bike group, I guess that's most of it. I think that this is a, a is something that's it's coming, reiterate what we got, but uh, the, the news is that's good is that they've got something that they're looking at that's, you know, we may not to have too much input about how they're going to deal with it. And that may answer Paul Webb's question too, is that uh, you've got other people deciding on how many lanes and they're going to make it right and they're going to do it perfectly. So uh, I don't see this asking for a reduction in lanes either. Thank you. And, and really quick, just to answer your question regarding Caltrans, I um, apologize, you know, with creating this letter, um, Matt crafted the letter and we were waiting to get further um, parties to add to the distribution list. And you are correct. Caltrans does need to be added to that list. Um, right, right. For that request. And so um, I just, add that just as an aside, letter. though, um, this is the kind of the letter that Gary was talking about that may be confusing to pe the recipients because there's a lot going on here and it's gonna take uh, some people some time to figure out how to distribute this. So it may be in the future, you mean your first two letters were perfect in that respect. Let me keep it simple, stupid kind of a thing. It just, uh, but not to say that there's not a lot that's not covered here, but I'm just saying that sometimes it's easier for people to di digest things and figure things out when it's, uh, there's less to have to think about. All right. Well, thank right. you for that consideration, Brad. Absolutely. Right, Don, you waited patiently. Go ahead, Don. Yeah. Um, 
at the very least, uh, the West Point Loma extension needs to be completed. It has worked well. The world didn't end by what we've done. It needs to be completed. Uh, secondly, the letter that that uh, Mandy read from a member of the public, that individual um, has run for the board perhaps six times in the last 10 years. The public has never elected that individual. And I don't think he deserves special consideration when uh, we're debating something. Thank you. All right, Corla. Yeah, I, I have to disagree with all of you about that. Letters from, it's on our website and it's encouraged. Letters and input from the community are encouraged and we have been uh, tasked with reading them due to these Zoom meetings. Otherwise, you know, if they don't wanna speak on Zoom, they could be there at a, a in-person meeting. We don't have that option. You don't have to like what people say, but they have the right to say it, uh, good, bad, or ugly. And then my comment about the letter is in, uh, tune with Brad's it's a little too much but I have just one issue with the word implore I think that's a strong too strong of a word for this type of letter I I fully support respectfully respectfully request but I think implore is the is the wrong uh, verb to use in that first paragraph thank you all right um Nicole Uh, thanks, and I appreciate the comments. So let me see if I can try to hit on a couple of those. Um, just a couple of that one, uh, Tracy, that was about the dog path. So really, this this Nimitz, we, this is, I, I don't know how many no letters we've sent on this corridor. We've sent a lot between OB and Peninsula over the last decade. So hopefully this is something that is moving forward, like Brad says. But it is a big long-term SANDAG EAP early action project. So it is going to be you know, evaluated at SANDAG. Caltrans is definitely aware of that intersection. Um, they have a Caltrans pedestrian advisory board that I've uh, made note of this. We've made note of it in our letters. Um, Caltrans does work with Everett at the mobility section in city of San Diego. So they, they can, if the city decides that they want to do some efforts to the north end of West Point Loma, they can work with Brandon at Caltrans and get a permit to do some striping through Caltrans right away. So that's nothing. Um, they've actually gotten a really good collaborative effort going there. Um, as far as Paul Webb, uh, regarding lane, rate, lane reductions, we're not requesting that at all. In fact, most of Nimitz has a buffered bike lane, so it can accommodate those flex posts. Um, I'm not exactly sure if speed differential, if lane width was uh, an issue down in the in the area where you're talking. I do know that it's down to one lane there, um, but I'll just bring into um, something that Will said: uh, is speed differentiation is huge, and we we have adopted Vision Zero in the city, so we are trying to implement facilities that can accommodate all ages and abilities and provide safe facilities. And when you get up over 35 miles per hour, the risk of dying on our streets just increases tremendously. So I commend the city's efforts for creating safer facilities for all users of the road. And that we, if it means reducing the lane because the traffic engineers figure that that's what they need to do, that's what they need to do. But that's not what we're asking for in the letter we're asking for some traffic mitigations. And uh, just lastly, uh, there is a kind, a kind of a lot in this letter, but just knowing that number one is really in the works, it just needs to be resurfaced. And number two is really in the works as it's being resurfaced and we have been advocating for flex posts on that one. So it's really just addressing that, that north section and including Caltrans on there will be great. And uh, I, Mandy, I do owe you a, a contact information for Gustavo, but um, I, I'm still working on that one, so sorry. All right, thank you, Nicole. And, and if we're ready for a motion, I will motion to accept the letter. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay, um, I, see this, I see Brad's hand, hand up if there's further uh, discussion. Me too after Brad, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. 
just just quickly, uh, yeah, there's a lot there, so I forgot what I was going to say. Um, regarding uh, and I, uh, Don's points well taken, and also I agree with Paul, uh, Mr. Jameson, um, that that and I brought it up to Gary today, and he didn't really know, but I said that this cycle this cycle track there on West Point Loma between Midway and I mean on uh, yeah with, between Midway and Nimitz is halfway done and it was supposed to be done. We had the hurry, hurry, hurry thing going. We did talk about it for quite some time, but it was like, you guys got to make a decision and prove this plan or this plan. And we talked about it and uh, it was in 2019. It was like, oh, it was going to be done in a month. And it, and I said, what happened? You know, this, this street's in bad shape. It's supposed to get resurfaced. We need to get those the cycle track completed, um, and I've ridden that a few times. And as soon as you hit that that uh, class four there, whatever it is, uh, certainly buffered. Um, it's awesome if that continued all the way, because for example, that that area Target, Home Depot, that's two miles from my house, and I've ridden from the little Target to the big Target using that that lane on my bike in eight minutes, I made every light, but still, I mean, and all these people that are potentially gonna be living in DK's neighborhood, their access to the beach, at the, and they're not gonna get in a car and driving and suck in traffic, they're gonna need to have a facility there that boom, pops them in the beach in a couple of minutes. So let's uh, uh, total advocate for getting that done. Oh, and I did leave a message for the traffic engineer who was previously responsible for that section because Gary didn't know when that was going to get done, but I, I haven't heard back. But uh, I'd be like, it'd be nice to know when are they going to do something there. So this is good that you're asking for it. Thank you. All right, and then Margaret, you had a comment. I just wanted to comment. I am piggybacking on Paul Webb's concern for the community about removal of lanes. We don't need that anymore in the community. It, traffic is already crazy enough, so. If we can tweak the letter that somewhat suggests or states that there won't be removal of lanes with these additions, I'd be all for it. Is there a potential, Nicole, to modify the letter to install these requests without the reduction of, of lanes? Well, as mentioned, it, it is a purely a safety concern. So if, if you, if like Paul says, we can reduce um, traffic speeds and, and slow traffic without removing lanes and still pre be able to provide the protected facility that um, is needed at those high speeds. But that's not something that I, I feel is needed in the letter. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm a little confused as well why there's concern about lane. We're not asking for any lane removal. We're just asking for the installation of the bike lanes. And if uh, there are bike lanes existing along that area. Um, right, so but, not, but they're going to do what they're going to, but they're going to do what they want to do. This is just a letter of recommendation. Yeah, so, so you're wanting to. It just seems like lanes are getting taken away more and more and more for bike lane. And I think, so, Mandy, that I think the concern is that unintended consequences, people, people are concerned that, that we write this letter and then all of a sudden lanes get taken away and everybody's yes. going, why, why did the planning board advocate to get rid of these lanes on him? Yes, Fred, yeah. that's it. So, Nicole, um, the motion stands if Nicole is unwilling to modify that portion of the letter. Is she uh, willing to, are you willing to modify and take no. out implore and put respectfully request? Would you be willing to modify? Oh yeah, I would do that oh, as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I no. already wrote that down. <laughs> I'm, uh, a little, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just a little hesitant to just to change that up. Um, until you actually, I, I appreciate Paul, you, Webby and Paul Grimes, you guys are out there on a bike and others, but to actually understand and feel what it feels like to be out on the road with cars passing at high speeds and without protection. Um, I'm going to leave it up to the city to provide the all ages and abilities Agreed. how they have to do it. Um, all right, Paul Webb. Just, just quickly, if, if there would be a, a statement that 
we didn't did not support lane reduction. I would support the letter. Without it, I cannot. Same, me too. Yes, I want to second that position. I'm very afraid of some of the unexpected consequences we do see when we don't expect that to happen. Yep. Nicole, I would recommend, sorry, I don't know if I'm out of line. I would ask that that be included yeah. as well. Um, okay. I think that would help bring this request to the city. And then again, like we stated earlier, um, on this, so it's it's say that again. It won't sorry, one it. at a time, please. I, sorry, I think there's a connectivity issue. Go ahead, Nicole. That is fine. All right, so the motion from Nicole has been modified. And so we're going to remove respectfully request uh, instead of implore. And then we're going to include verbiage that we, re with this request that no lanes be reduced along the corridor. Um, and I have seconded that motion. Is there any more discussion? I would like to be sure Nicole is okay with that. She wasn't, and, and then I believe you acquiesced. I just wanna be positive. Oh, I believe I she did confirm that. Yeah, but I, I think it's fair and fair. Uh, Nicole got it. I don't want to say bullied, but she got asked numerous times whether whether she was. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. There is. So, and then she was breaking up. So I couldn't really hear exactly what Nicole had to say. So and, and a, a different motion can be made if she doesn't feel comfortable with that. OK, let's that refer is, back to Margaret or to Nicole. I do not want to make that motion. So I will remove my motion and somebody else can make the motion that way. Well, the motion has been moved and seconded and it needs the action. Uh, it has to be voted. Yeah, because it's going to be voted if you don't take that. Uh, well, let's go for the vote without it. I mean, maybe under we'll Mark parliamentary, under parliamentary law, uh, the motion on a floor, uh, there could be a motion to amend and that would be voted up or down. We haven't heard anybody say um, move and second to amend the motion. She can no. retract her motion too for Robert's rules. I thought when a motion had been seconded that you had to complete the action unless it had been amended. That was right. my understanding. Correct. I think that's correct. So I think I think we have a motion by Nicole for the letter that has been seconded. And she she does not feel comfortable uh, with with making any um, amendment to the letter regarding uh, no reduction of lanes. So I think we just need to vote. We need to uh, vote on that motion, unless okay. unless I'm wrong. Paul Paul Webb, what do you think? Well, can I make a motion to amend to add language to the letter to uh, include that we do not support the reduction of traffic lanes? The motion maker doesn't agree with that amendment. No, she doesn't agree okay. with it. Okay. So they have to agree to the amendment. Yeah. Okay. Yes. No, never mind. No, no, no. It. You can make an, a motion to amend. Just let's, this is let's not a friendly. This let's is not a friendly motion. This is not a friendly amendment. That and Nicole Paul refuses Webb can make to make a new motion. You can mm -hmm. uh, make an amendment, which would takes precedence. And that she has to be voted it, up Don. or down. Okay. If it doesn't pass. We can make a new motion. Sure. All right, All right, let's go ahead yeah, and go for it. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna call the we're gonna call the roll. We're gonna vote on Nicole's motion for the letter with no mention of uh, regarding the lane reduction. Okay. All right. So does, does everybody? I think that everybody's clear on the motion. The motion is by Nicole, seconded by Mandy, for the letter, and it is going to be silent on uh, our position on whether lanes will be reduced. So I'll uh, call the roll. Um, uh, if you're in favor of the letter, yes, it, it, or else if you're uh, against it without that reduction, no. So, Mark, you're first. I hate being first, but I vote no. Okay. Brad? Yes. Corla? I was saying no. I, I like the amendment. Uh, Mandy? Um, I seconded the motion, so I say yes. Uh, Don? Yes. Angela? No. Nicole? Yes. Matt? Yes. Joe? No. Sam? No. Paul? No. 
One, two, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So the motion fails uh, five to six. I'd like to make a motion um, to approve the letter with the amendments to request that there be no lane reduction um, with this request um, and as well change the employer to respectfully request. I'll second that motion. Okay. I was going to say, Fred could make or break a tie, right? I could yes, make or break a but tie. But I, can also, I also could be Switzerland. And I'm not going. I'm not going to make or break a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Just I, I, I think the board is doing the right thing here. So I, we have a motion by Mandy, uh, second by Paul, to to add a comment on uh, no lane reduction and, and change the employer language to respectfully request. And I think we're ready to vote. So I'm going to go down and Margaret, you get to go first again. So Margaret. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, Brad. I can come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I muted myself. I mean, I, I guess. Yeah, okay. I just thought you were Apolog thinking. Apologies. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Carla, did you vote? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was laughing too hard. Um, <laughs> yes, I vote yes. Brad makes me laugh. Okay, he Mandy? Does. Yes. Uh, Don? Yes. Uh, Angela? Yes. Nicole? No. Matt? I'll go yes. Joe? Yes. Sam? Yes. Paul? Yes. All right, that passes uh, 10 to 1. Dan, I don't, have to, I don't have to make or break a tie. Perfect. <laughs> OK, and then I have one final action item. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the final screen. And this is um, our letter regarding um, this came out of environmental and um, we had um, invited um, John and Tracy Vandewalker. They are the local residents that live along um, Newport, the 4400 block of Newport Avenue in Santa Barbara. Um, this has been a hot ticket item in the community and a lot of the issues that um, have arisen out of this is due to the lack of uh, communication and uh, this letter is requesting transparency um, specifically with regard to um, who owns uh, the trees and who does not there is a right-of-way easement there and um, the property owners based on the easement it's it's showing that they own up to the middle of the street and so um, John and Tracy had come to the environmental subcommittee. We wanted to hear their concerns. Um, and this letter was drafted out of that um, request. Um, everyone can read it. Um, a lot of the main issues that came out of this is that these palms are, um, they do have a historical back, uh, background. They were planted by DC Collier, um, who is known to be the, the father of Ocean Beach. And so um, the reason these palms are being removed is that they interfere with the existing radar system that the airport uses when the, air, when the airplanes come in from the west side. And um, the reason is every, like, every five to 10 years, they do an evaluation. And based on the uh, height of the, the trees, um, they are you know, identified and they are selected to be removed. Some of the concerns that come with this, uh, this issue with the city is that um, there is word that they're going to be transitioning over to a new ILS um, 5G LIDAR system, which would then eliminate the need to remove any of these um, potential interference, you know, these objects that would interfere. And as well as, um, so that was one concern that they had. 
Um, the trees in question are about 67 feet tall. And as you can see, they were planted about over 100 years ago. The rate of growth that the city is stating that Washingtonian palms have is 2.5 feet per year. And if that were the case, then those, those palms would be well over 200 feet. And so that's another question that has come um, with regard to um, the removal of the trees. Um, and so we did invite them to come. And really this is a letter. Um, we do know that palm trees do not really provide an environmental benefit. Uh, they're actually called, um, they're considered woody herbs and they don't go through the same process of um, photosynthesis is where you know the leaves on trees pull the carbon out of the air and they store that carbon in the trunk. And so that does not happen with palms. Um, but there is a historical element here. Um, they were planted along that area because Santa Barbara used to be the main thoroughfare um, down into Ocean Beach. And that's why they, they ended up there. And so we did invite John and Tracy and we have made some requests to the city regarding the concerns over the right of way and the ownership of the trees that are being discussed. And really just a request for information. We're wanting to find out what is the process. We'd like them to be transparent and provide the community with that process so that we can understand um, the you know the process more and as well as create an opportunity for the neighbors to potentially appeal if this if their trees were to be identified in the future one of the concerns that did come out originally is when the neighbors did get the letter from the city that was dated october 8th the code that was listed on the letter was incorrect and so the neighbors felt like they were being sent down a, a wild goose chase. And so um, I would like to open up, I'll stop sharing the screen. Um, and I'd like to open up the floor. Um, is John and Trace, oh, there you are. Hi, <laughs> we're Brady Bunch in it here. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for Tracy and John to speak, and then we can open it up for further discussion. Yes, one of the reasonings that um, we asked for your help um, in drafting this letter is due to the fact of, yes, we didn't get any information um, after, after receiving these letters and the time between receiving those letters and the time that they came to cut the trees, we had approximately two business days. And so that gave us no time to try to figure out the reasoning behind since they, they provided us the codes that they're saying weren't really the right codes. And it was really due to the radars. And after finding all this out, they were already cutting down the trees and um, we were asking for the reports, um, the FAA reports, the calculations they were using, any of the information and the reasoning why they were cutting it down. And we were getting nowhere with them and we tried, um, council person Jen Campbell um, to no avail. We've tried the mayor to no avail. We tried every um, avenue we could and with no responses um, and no help. And um, this is where we're at. And the only person recently that has been in somewhat helping us is the CODA from um, that you had mentioned Mandy earlier from, yeah, from the, the mayor's, mayor's office. Yes, he has um, actually is the only one who's been replying somewhat to any of our emails um, saying he recently said that he doesn't have them at this point on the schedule for removal. He doesn't see them on the schedule and that they, thought that they'd be looking into it. But at the same time, um, just the other day, um, after the letter, they came and put more caution tape up around the trees and um, do not park signs all around the trees. So they're still <laughs> like in the midst of coming out all the time and 
putting up the caution tape and putting down the, the signs. And so we don't know really where this is going. You know, we can't get any, still any answers um, from the from the city, from the, the from the forestry department, from the FAA, from the airport authority, on um, again any of their calculations, any of the um, that they're using to be able to take down these trees. And, and Fred, and Mandy, I got a specific email about this issue from Tabitha Berry, who's in the on the call, and I would like to give her an opportunity to speak if she wishes. All right, All right sure. Tabitha, go ahead. Hi. Go ahead, Tabitha. Hi, all. Thank you so much for um, doing what you do. I know it's a lot of time commitment and all of that as well. Um, Tracy is a neighbor of mine, and I'm one of the neighbors who got one of the letters on probably October 12th, though dated the 8th, and also got an individualized picture saying our adjacent trees, not even our property trees, were going to be cut. And um, we all, upon finally texting neighbors saying, hey, did you get a letter? Did you get a letter? And um, we all discovered, we got letters with different pictures of identifying, you know, one or two trees in those individual pictures. Um, as we, you know, discovered each person got a different picture, all of a sudden we're like 10, 15 trees were being um, targeted to be cut. I didn't realize, you know, prior to that, that Tracy and John had already taken actions to contact um, Jen Campbell, the mayor, um, I don't know if OB town council or whomever, they had reached out a lot, um, but we were able to all finally connect to realize something just wasn't right. And speaking to the code that John and Tracy had done a lot of research on immediately, um, most of us were very unaware of what was going on. So anyway, um, I reached out on behalf of the neighborhood and, and, and as it a lot of other neighbors just trying to get answers and we just feel like we've been the stonewalled and not gotten any any say and it's become an emergency situation and all of us doing our research realize that our understanding is that the planning board is um, supposed to give permission or supposed to be included on the discussions if trees are supposed to be cut from prior um, issues in the neighborhood so anyway we're just we're still I don't want to say flailing because we're far from that. Tracy and John have really stepped up and the neighborhood and just trying to piece this together and get answers related to what's, what's happening um, from it was radar first and turps and um, or it was a whole bunch of different answers. It just it just wasn't adding up and for us not be part of the conversation, which someone I think Danny mentioned earlier, OB likes to be part of the conversation. <laughs> And so, um, or just, you know, just understand what's going on. If they need to go, then they need to go. But the way that it's been handled has really, you know, left a really um, sore spot for the way it's handled. And prior to, you know, um, some of the neighbors having chasing down the trucks going, where's your permit? Where's, where's the answers? Where's the identification of we should move our cars? Because they literally were coming out with the trucks, cutting down what was open at the time. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll step All aside, right, but thank you so much. for Thank you, for, Tabitha. Thank you. Um, I see Glenn Kroc uh, Miller, so public comment. Glenn, do you have a comment you want to make? I, I do, thank you. Uh, my name is Glenn Millar. Um, I live in OB, I've moved here about three and a half years ago. I own a uh, business in uh, Point Loma as well, uh, a handyman business. Um, I heard about this at the very last minute, I, uh, you know, uh, middle of October, after the letters had gone out, uh, went down there that morning to help protest it. And I learned very quickly what I thought was going on and what I believe the problem is and something that needs to be uh, elevated. These are historic trees and they're very important and that is a big point. But what concerns me most as a citizen is the rapid uh, way this was put through, how it was called an emergency by elected officials to have it done. And what concerned me is that government is there to serve us. We elect officials to represent us. They should be transparent. And this was done so quickly and so much without um, community uh, input it was done under the radar. 
it was deemed an emergency, so there was no community meetings. People who have heard the reasonings about the FAA who are knowledgeable start to question it. And then the representative from the city, a gentleman named, I believe, uh, Brian, I may have his last name wrong, Wittermere, I believe it is. He was there, he got a chance to speak. And when a, a group of citizens, maybe 50 or 60 people at that point, started to ask questions, his answer, and I quote, was, I don't have to answer questions from you. We are cutting these trees down today and there is nothing you can do about it, okay? Those words might not be exact, but they're pretty, they're pretty close. And again, I'm very concerned when a government and the people representing us aren't listening and aren't having two-way communication with us. Obviously, we've tried to get a hold of our representative, uh, Jen Campbell, and she is, as usual, <laughs> missing in action on this point. I don't know why. And I think it's important that the Community Planning Board hear this and realize that citizens want to be heard. They want to transparency from the elected officials. And we may disagree, and that's fine, but when you try to hide something from the people who elected you, it's not good for everybody, anybody or everybody. So I think this needs to take much more time. It's not an emergency. And the point of, they are historic trees, and let's discuss this and figure out if there's a way to get around this and to please the FAA or please the city without taking down these historic trees. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Glenn. Thank you. I uh, will turn to Brad, uh, Brad and, thank and board comment. Thank you, Fred. <clears throat> um, I had a, a little bit of a conversation with Tracy uh, a couple of weeks back, and I think that I talked to uh, you, Fred, after that and contacted Mandy and because of the uh, environmental committee. Now, um, <clears throat> Tracy, when we had talked, uh, there was something that was going to be happening on a Tuesday. It was, I don't know, was there a court hearing or? Yes. It, and what transpired there? Well, at the time, it was the Thursday when um, the, when everyone came together and there, um, as as Glenn said, um, Brian Widener was there. We came to the decision at the last minute and we were pretty much told that we needed to um, hire a lawyer, pretty much ASAP, if we didn't want the trees cut down. So at the last minute that, that evening, we were, that afternoon, we were hiring a lawyer and trying to get that going as quick as possible. So he was trying to come up with anything to try to get a TRO um, immediately. So he was going on the point of it would um, take down the value of the house, just try to get anything in. So of course, when we've been to the federal judge and the, the court, she had um, decided that the temper, um, I'm sorry, the city could pay us out monies to, to deal with that and that um, they weren't on our property so they could cut down the trees. They were the city trees so they could cut them down and they weren't on our property. And, but the, if it was going to, if it was going to take down the value of our house that they could, um, again, repay us in monies. Huh. Um, it, I mean, I, I feel for all of you that are there, I mean, these trees, it, as someone who's lived here most of my life and my family, which has been here for generations, um, you can see this, the line of trees there in Santa Barbara from all the way across the city. I mean, these are signature trees. I mean, they're, uh, I mean, from a distance that is Point Loma in a way. So I don't know, and it certainly seems as though there is a disconnect between bureaucracies and what I, I guess I'm just don't understand why our elected representatives are not listening. Um, I, I talked with Fred about this briefly and Fred, I mean, I mean, it sounds like they tried to do some kind of, 
I don't know if you do an is injunction even the right, right, right word or I mean uh, as a board uh, I mean we see the plight here and I think we're all in agreement I mean maybe the trees aren't in front of our house but you know I live a block from Santa Barbara I mean I walk by those trees every single day um, so they mean something to me so uh, what, what I mean certainly we're going to vote for this letter but we have to is, is that what else can we do beside that? Well, it's just a, it's just the the case of the understanding of they there's no reasoning for them taking them down, um, in in my mind. But if there is, show us the reasoning behind it. Yes. Um, awesome. Show us the calculations um, for it being them being too tall, which they stated on the code first on the letter, which then they would have to be, um, by the code they stated, they would have to be 300 feet tall, which is not the case. So then they came back and said, it's based on this TERPS, the radar system, which if you talk to certain pilots say, no, there's no way that, um, that those trees would um, come in play with the radar system. Um, that they've landed, they flew the, the huge FedEx jets in, in the inclement weather and will tell you, you know, no problems whatsoever. So they don't know what they're talking about. And again, right. as um, my husband knows, he's an engineer and was talking about them changing to the LIDAR, the GPS, uh, the GPS system instead of what they have um, due to it being so antiquated, what they have now, and they were supposed to start changing it back in 2019 um, is when they were supposed to change it over. So they should be in the process of changing it to the GPS system as it is. Then if they do that, then the trees wouldn't even come into play with, with the, um, the ILS system they're using now as it is. So why, why would you take them down if you're changing to the GPS system anyway? Yeah, okay, Corla, did you have a comment, system. Corla? Yeah, well, I'd like to thank these community members for their patience. Uh, and it's too bad you were last on the, on the uh, a controversy. <laughs> with it. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Three uh, hours. Oh. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for, for your participation. Um, I have a question, a comment. Did you not lose in court on the ownership issue? Did the judge rule against you? And is that part of the letter still valid? And then my comment as devil's advocate in our first paragraph where we say unanimously, uh, there's always gonna be someone uh, that's not unanimously for that. Uh, so I maybe would like to remove unanimously, but I like oh. overwhelmingly. Do you see what I mean? Cause there's always, yeah, right there. you know, yeah, just technically, I'm sorry. I, I, I think I, that's, that's smart, Corla. I can definitely yeah. modify that just is overwhelmingly against the removal of these. Yeah. The yeah. 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 And and did you guys not lose in court on that ownership and how would that affect the letter uh, in the uh, accuracy? Of well, the coming to find out on the laws of California and putting it, down across surveyors, which I, I'm doing research as we speak right now, that um, we do we do own the street out to the center line. We do own the property out to the center line of the street. Um, but, it's just technically you. whether you it's um, the city has the right of way easement on it on the street. But did but, the judge rule that you that you did? Well, we weren't that? going on that at that time, and she the wasn't. Movie, they said you didn't own it. Am, is, that, is that a mistake? That I just and That's just for the mistake. record, Corla, I I, in the, I read in the paper. So however however accurate the, the Union Tribune is, the Union Tribune <laughs> article said the same thing. So that, that yeah, the judge so ruled thought... that the trees were in the easement, and so that the city owned the trees, and they had the right to do with what they wanted with them. Yeah, so my question on that is how does that affect our letter and the accuracy? If that's been ruled, it obviously can be appealed. But at this time, if if you've been ruled against on that, if that would affect well, the, the, the city didn't even cut the trees. Yeah. Well, and so I, I, you, I don't know how they could own the trees if they didn't even plant the trees in the first place. Yeah. Well, I, I feel your pain on transparency as well because this board and, and all of us right. have been dealing with all of that repeatedly. So I'll mm -hmm. just let someone else. All right, I'm trying to let everybody get some that new hands. I've seen Sam. I see a comment from Sam and from Paul Webb. 
Yes. Um, this at the end where it's uh, the paragraph by being more transparent so forth, I almost think that could either be deleted or worded in the active voice instead because uh, um, I just don't see what it adds. And I, that was the only comment I had on the letter. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sam. All right, Paul. Uh, just, just to point out, I had two street trees in city right of way that were damaging my property. They were causing cracks in a garden wall. I could not take them out. They, they were owned by the city. I had to convince the city to remove them. Uh, even though I was willing to remove them at my own expense, I could not. If they, if they are located, in, you're the attorney, Fred, but if they're in what's called the, the dominant tenement, the, the easement holder or the right of way holder has every right to do with those trees what they want, like it or not. Right, and so I would say that, um, you know, without having read the legal briefs, I mean, Judge Bashant is a thoughtful federal court judge and um, she's probably right on the law that, that the city, they're in the city right away and the city has the right to do with them. So the question is though, in support of the community, do we want to write a letter saying that, you know, the city should rethink this whole plan because the city, I well, mean, I there's, no, it, there's no good reason for why they're doing this. I don't really understand why they're taking the trees out, but they do own them well, and, and they have the right. Well, to I, I can provide a, a little bit of an explanation. Yeah. The, the FAA but, wants every airport to look exactly like every other airport in every respect, lighting, uh, runway signage, uh, you name it. And what they've done is they've, they've come up with what are called imaginary surfaces. And they, they project these out mathematically from, from the runway. And they do the same exact imaginary surfaces at every airport. And if uh, an object intrudes or penetrates into those imaginary surfaces, they deem it an obstacle and ask for it to be removed. Now, in the case of uh, many of the obstacles or the penetrations in San Diego, like uh, Balboa Park, you can't remove the ridge of Balboa Park, but in terms of structures, you can remove a structure or you can modify it or you can remove a tree. And that's why they're doing this, rightly or wrongly, that's why they're doing this. And according to their calculations, the trees are coming within five feet of, mm -hmm. of penetrating the imaginary surfaces. Now, the city has done an abysmal job of communicating with, with the members of the public. Uh, and, and I think we need to at least address a need for better communication on all issues, but on, in this instance, on this issue. Um, Thank you. By the way, uh, in federal court, that was about damages and about the property. Um, what damages would happen to the value of our property if the property was removed? It was not an attorney, so I'm not going to speak to that. Okay, but the in the what happened on the court case in the federal court? It wasn't about that. This was our property at that time. We were not arguing that. We're saying that it would affect the value of our property. Well, again, I'm not an attorney, but I will say I've been in, involved in an, any many situations where people were claiming inverse condemnation. Uh, I have seen very few people prevail. Exactly. Exactly. All right, Margaret, uh, did you have a comment? I do. I'm a Point Loma native, as most of you know, grown, born and raised in the paths of uh, Point Loma High School there where you cannot get rid of the, the plant. Things. And I've got to tell you right now, my grandparents have one of the most tallest pine trees you could find in Point Loma. You can't miss it in any view of Point Loma. You can go to the mountaintops and, and like you, Paul uh, Webb, it's going through the cracks and cracking the, the sidewalks. And it is so dangerous. And we've reported it for safety. Our, our UPS guys have tripped. And they won't come remove it. And they, I mean, I love trees. I'm for trees. They will remove it. There's a hidden agenda behind the, these, these few palm trees in Ocean Beach. And I hate to tell you, but this is worth a fight. And you've got to fight it. This is just one street of trees away from the main pathway. Let's get real. Like, I mean, come on. Like, it just doesn't make sense, this 
this whole deal and give those neighbors a heads up. I mean, I can guarantee you everyone on that street right there has no no issues with the palm trees. The community doesn't have issues. There's higher palm trees in Point Loma obstructing these the the pathways of the airplane. There's just something way weird about this group. And I support a letter going to our district leaders that demands respect and demands answers for these neighbors. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Um, Glenn, did you want to say anything more, Matt? All right, go ahead, Glenn. Two things to add, if I may, please. Uh, first, in what you were saying, Paul, does the FAA have the right to ask for it? I, I'm not a lawyer. I suspect you may be right. But I also suspect the trees don't grow, the palms don't grow that very, don't grow very fast. And when it, tra when it goes from, we need some of these removed eventually, because they're hitting certain heights to, we have to do this right now. I, as a citizen, start to question what exactly is going on there. That's not an FAA issue. That's a city issue. Absolutely also, agree with you. Absolutely agree. Thank you. Um, I also have to question this. I have a tree in my backyard. I live at the corner of Venice and uh, Niagara. I'm at the top of the hill. There's a palm in my backyard that's about 50 feet tall. It is significantly taller because I'm at the top of the hill than the palms that are sitting in Tracy's front yard. We've never been asked to, we've never been told to take it down. It's sitting in our property. So one has to question why the public right of way trees, why are those so important? And again, it begs the question, what exactly is the city hiding? And I, as a citizen, want to know the answers to that before I, you know, leave this fight. Again, thank you for listening. Thank you. All right, Matt? All right, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I I appreciate the comments uh, and kind of description that Paul Webb was able to provide because to, to me, it seems like there's kind of two main issues that are going on in this letter, right? Um, that there's concern over the palm tree removal, and there's concern over the communication and process of this. And to some extent, these are two separate things. I mean, they're all intertwined and like how, how it's played out, I don't think anyone here uh, thinks is appropriate. Um, that, that being said, uh, I, I kind of want to pose it to the board. Like, it, it seems to me quite, it, it seems like our, our role in this is definitely to advocate on behalf of um, our community in terms of you know the the lack of communication, pretty much the horrible job the city's done in terms of how this has been rolled out, is it our job to also um, wade into the FAA part? Like that, I feel like I know less about, and you know some of the paragraphs in the letter, I'm a little bit less comfortable that make statements there. Like I I appreciate you know uh, Tracy and John coming to the uh, environment committee and helping break down, spell some of that out for me but I'm not sure if that's where we should focus our letter for the board when we could make it more singularly focused on the process and how this is played out and what uh, the city needs to do in terms of communicating all of this with its residents. Thank you, Matt. Um, in no way have I promised, and Tracy and John can, in the meeting, I am not promising saving. We're not promising the saving of these trees. This is really a request for information because mm -hmm. communication is key. You know, when you don't communicate properly, we get into issues like this. And as community members, we want to feel seen and we want to feel heard. And they did bring some very valid concerns. Um, just speaking to the earlier question with regard to the right of way, I'd like to keep that verbiage in there because I would like to receive clarification from the city. Um, as to where that is, you know, because what a lot of people don't realize is in the right of way is where a lot of the urban forestry is. And if they're, if they can confirm who's responsible for the care of those trees, it could, you know, it could change the outcome of the urban forestry within our um, city. And so I would like to keep that verbiage in there, regardless of the ruling, you know, the law is the law. I'd like to get further clarification of where the line is um, so that the neighbors do understand 
where the line is and where their liability starts. Um, uh, and, and again, it being a request for information. And then finally, you know, I know that the city has stated that they're interested in reaching out to the community, um, but the outcome is canopy trees can be planted in between these palms to achieve canopy. And so if, um, if they are removed um, or, you know, whatever comes out of this, that the city work with the community to replace the trees or to plant canopy trees of their selecting, you know, that would, you know, that they'd like to see in the community. Um, this is really just more of a, a, you know, a request for information and clarification of the standard and what, where are these reports, where is this information so that we can educate ourselves and potentially in the future, they can appeal if it is, um, if that is allowed in the process. And so um, I, uh, Brad, you had a, a question? Um, uh, I'm just, uh, I was quickly gonna see who this was addressed to, because I'm wondering because of the Paul's need, comment. Oh, sorry. I, I do need to add some contacts to the distribution for the FAA and I need I was to gonna say, that. do Scott Peters or something like that. I mean, he's gonna be our congressional representative and I mean, at least he would have some national poll. And then um, regarding motivation, I don't know how many times I've watched these trees shed fronds or, uh, and also watch them try to trim them. Are they getting to a point where they're, that the city doesn't have the equipment to be able to get up and, and maintain these no. trees? Because they're getting, no, no way? No, no they have, the, their buckets are, just fine on reaching them. I mean, okay. they, they have their their oh, trucks yes. with the, the bucket trucks that they're fine on, um, but they barely, they mostly don't um, trim them anyway down the right. street. Well, um, I mean, look at the piles of fronds that we end up having in all the parking strips as up and down the streets. I mean, truckloads of, I mean, I'm just wondering if they're just getting sick of throwing all these these fronds into the landfill or something. Well, and that's I think that they're just- on that. They're tired of cleaning. That's what I mean. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're, they're trying to clean it up after them. It's like yeah. Ready to so, uh, so as we approach ten o'clock at night, is a do we want to make a motion here or something? I would like to make a motion to send the letter um, as is. I did remove the unanimously uh, amendment that Corla had mentioned earlier, but really this request is a letter for information and to request more transparency because this is what has brought us to this situation right here. Um, I'll second so, it. Second by Brad. Thank you. I, I wanted to propose one other small edit. Um, sure. In the, the second page, the second full paragraph, um, saying the city erroneously claims the trees cannot exceed a combined height. What if we take out the word erroneous? Like, are we sure that that's actually the case? Of like, what? if we take it out. The mathy oh. question, but I, I think we need to question their 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 rate of growth. That's no, I, and, and and by removing the word erroneously, we're not, you know, removing the ability to question the rate of growth. I think we're taking a strong position if we say erroneous when I I don't feel comfortable enough with the FAA regulations to make that. Sure. Claim. Yeah, I can go ahead and remove that verbiage and again claim, you know, just. Just question. I think we can change that um, to question the. The rate of growth that they that they uh, use. I can remove that. That's fine. Any other friendly amendments before we go further? All right. All right. Go ahead, Fred. It's time, it's time to vote. Margaret. Yes. Brad. Yes. Corla. Yes. Mandy. Yes. Don. Yes. Angela. Yes. Nicole. Going once, going twice, Nicole. I see you, but if you're there, come out. Matt. Yes. Joe. Yes. Sam. Yes. Paul Webb. Yes. It's like 10 to nothing. All right. Perfect.
There we go. So I think I think that that's right. So Nicole is saying yes. Oh, she is. Nicole. Oh, she did. She put it in the chat. All right, that'll get us eleven to nothing then. All right, you know. And now that now that we're done, I'll just say that it's been very frustrating when I tried to call Monique and talk to Jen Campbell's office. So I think that this letter is a good idea because. I've I've talked to Monique several times about this and gotten gotten nothing. So I, I feel I feel the pain of the neighbor. It's so. a little interesting that she left exactly when we started talking <laughs> yeah, about this. So, so sending a letter over to her. Is, is, is I'm totally happy did. to do that. <laughs> a Cole hangs in there. Look at him. He's, he's a dying Bye. Heart. And Cole, he's he's getting the numbers up. His his brownie points. Uh, you know, I have a relationship a little bit with Josh Coyne, who's over in Jen Campbell's office. I'm going to call him at least, find out what's going on. I mean, he's pretty straightforward with me, so maybe that'll help. So I'll, I'll give Josh, him a chance. Josh took a new job. He's not. He's not. Uh, he's not there he's anymore. Office. No, he took a new job a few weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Thanks, DK. <laughs> oh well, so much for that thought. Thanks. All right. Well, that that's all I've got on the agenda. So I mean, we can stay in chat all night. But it, does anybody? Thank else you guys so day? much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, oh, let's go eat dinner. We'll get you that letter and once it's signed by Fred. Okay. Thank you. Thank we you. really appreciate yeah. all your help. You're welcome. Our pleasure. We'll, we'll Thank you so much, everybody. Job. Thank you, folks. Bye, everybody. All right. All right. We're done. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.